start. Starting recording. I can start though. There we go. Right. I'm gonna open it with a, uh, a poll from Michelangelo, actually. Rav yeah, yeah. Ravished by all that uh, to the eyes is fair, yet hungry for the joys that truly bless. My soul can find no stair to mount to heaven, save Earth's loveliness. For from the stars above descends a glorious light that, fill, that lifts our longing to the highest height and bears the name of love. Nor is there aught can move a gentle heart or purge or make it wise, but beauty and the starlight of her eyes. Uh, that was, I think, Michelangelo's poem number 226. Uh, but that poem was written around the same time and within the milieu of Marsilio Ficino and the Florentine Academy uh, as he was translating Plotinus's Enneads. Um, and so there is much speculation as to whether this poem, along with a few others which I'll mention later on, were uh, directly influenced then by the tractate we're going to be talking about today uh, for the second episode of Conversio on uh, on beauty, uh, Plotinus's Enneads. Uh, and he had one tractate six. Uh, this might be one of his most influential tractates. It seems that the scholarship says so. I have no real reason to doubt that. Um, it's gorgeous. Uh, but before I get too far into anything more, I'm joined here today by uh, my good friend Alexander, uh, notorious pagan, uh, a Neoplatonist from Twitter. Um, I'll let him introduce himself, so... Yeah, hello. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've already been <laughs> kind of introduced. That's what I'm most famous for anyway on Twitter, um, arguing with everyone. Um, sometimes I have takes that aren't as controversial, so that's why Aris shares me around sometimes. Um, <laughs> okay. But then, yeah, then other times it's... it's <laughs> you'll see me because he's replying to something I've said. Um, and just, you know, epic owning me or something, yeah, but, um, go get fucked. <laughs> yeah, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm on Twitter. Um, I run a website. Um, my handle is apotheite. It's a P O T H E double -I, I T E. And then, yeah, my website is apotheism.com, which is a P O T H E I S M.com. Um, which is All mainly theology. The yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's generally like Hellenic theology and philosophy mm. kind of stuff. And then the odd political take and psychological, psychological take just because I just randomly get inspired to do so sometimes. So. Yeah. Based. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. that's me. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Before we dive into the tractate. I want you to give like the audience, uh, how do I put it? Just like, you're going to hate me for this uh, because it'll end up being uh, really reductive, but I want it to be a bit reductive. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> okay. You've met a man on the street and somehow within like five seconds of talking to him, he's asking you, who is this Plotinus dude? Oh, why does he matter? And you have to give him like, how, how how let's say maybe a minute of your time to just explain who he is where he was in history and what impact he had and why anyone should care uh go well um depending on the random person i met i may just say to him sorry you can't understand but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but um this is just, just presume that he's not um you know he's he's of a level-headed kind um well, what we know of Plotinus, he was born basically at the turn of the, or turn of the uh, uh, second century into the third century. Um, and so he was born in like, I think, 204 or something like that. And, um, and he died heading towards the end of the third century. But um, he lived in, I guess, like a, in a period where there was a lot of, like, when it comes to philosophy, there was a lot of tro problems in that the, the predominant kind of philosophic view at the time was either um, uh, Stoicism or um, the other one. <laughs> that, the that, other that, one, that not even, even Epicureanism, <laughs> um, 
and it's it usually bounces somewhere between that and um and of course you have the the backdrop of the rise of christianity and um and also gnosticism which is also kind of contemporary to his time as a mm-hmm. rising force um but yeah so why is he important i mean i guess it's it's because i guess he was at this time when traditional religion in general was being challenged not just by like christians but by like epicureans and by gnostics that there was this kind of necessity to respond in some way um you could say if you wanted to try and contextualize him which um i don't really like doing that with philosophers i don't like contextualizing to the extent that you say that they did something because of their circumstances um i think that obviously a philosopher needs to have something born in his soul to be able to do what he does and so it should be irrelevant to his circumstances but in any case um there was this need for a um what's the word restoration of i guess of platonism in, in this better understanding that was supposedly at least according to platonists or the late platonists or the neoplatonists how you want to call them um which i agree with is that there was a loss of understanding of how plato intended his works and that they revived it and plotinus was kind of at the beginning of that revival of returning to a better understanding of plato um and it kind of i mean it kind of began with the middle platonist but um plotinus was the big heavyweight i guess you could say that really brought it all together um with his tractates and yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure that the person on the street has walked off by now, being like, well, <laughs> "Yeah, I don't even want to know about this." But um, <laughs> like his importance to religion has been like extreme. Like every every religion has been impacted by Plotinus, Jewish, pagan, Christian, Gnostic, Muslim. Yeah, like they yeah. they've all have yeah. some kind of root with Plotinus and the philosophy that he produced, and then the philosophy he would inspire to be produced by others after him so he's very important in that he kind of gave the groundwork for a lot of religious theology yeah definitely um i think another point which would be interesting to kind of press is that you'll hear the the word neoplatonism being thrown around and it's almost just common philosophical parlance now but initially when it was devised it was to stress the discontinuity between what Plato taught and what Plotinus and everybody else following after him taught. Uh, And, well, Plotinus would never have seen it this way and neither would anyone from him down to Damascus have thought of themselves as somehow innovating, creating new doctrines, as opposed to uncovering, excavating, and clarifying further what Plato already taught. Uh, perhaps they might challenge him on manners of expression, but on the you know the essential truth content of what he says, like they they hold faithful, uh, or at least that is the intention. The intention is always to hold faithful. And obviously, within like the the academy, they'll challenge each other. Like Proclus and Syrianus will challenge Damascus, and the Amblicus will challenge Porphyry. But in amongst even their own squabbles, they they very much still believe that they are carrying the torch of what Plato actually taught. Yeah, and like it's it's literally like when they like disagree with each other, it's kind of like no, Plato meant this rather than like saying yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Plato was wrong, and I think this. Like yeah. it was always trying to like clarify, like no, you misunderstood like what was being taught. It's always like he's kind of like the holy text. Of yeah, like exactly. of the Platonists and like trying to, but but this is yeah that's the big thing. Like I mean, when you when you come to understand how academics understand Plato, you realize that they don't understand him at all. Um, and this is why they think there's this discontinu- discontinuity between the like neo Platonists and the Platonists that were of Plato is because yeah. they completely misunderstand Plato, like horribly wrong. So. That's why they think they're different. But the thing is that the the late Platonists, which is the more 
amicable term to use rather than neoplatonist. I like the term yeah. late Platonist. I got it from um, what's his name? Gregory Shaw. Yeah, yeah, I got it from Gregory nice. Shaw. Nice. He, he was using it. Um, the late Platonists, they were, um, yeah, they were very much in tune with what Plato was talking about, and they didn't have this ridiculous understanding. And in and, and that, yeah, so with academics, when they read late Platonists, because the late Platonists were very um, not exoteric, but they weren't trying, they, they, they didn't write the same way as Plato. They wrote in a very, like, um, uh, like dialectical manner. So, yeah. and there was no esoteric elements in the sense that they didn't write in riddles or anything like that. Um, so I guess when they read that and then try to compare it to Plato and they assume that Plato was writing the same way, which he wasn't, Plato was writing in a deliberately like riddled kind of esoteric manner. Yeah. Um, they can't compare the two. That's where they make the split. But yeah, like, I mean, you can, you can cope and see that it's otherwise, <laughs> but um, it's not. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's, yeah, that's, that's the case. <laughs> yeah. Cause um, I think the most charitable kind of uh, thing you could probably ascribe to the academic, like the academics who look through Plato and, all sorts of modern philosophers who see the discontinuity. They have this kind of unfortunately very strict hit like kind of reading of history where it's like, okay, so Plato said this on the surface, perhaps. And then the middle Platonists come around, they say something different. And then the Neoplatonists are reacting to what the middle Platonists say, and they almost entirely throw out a whole bunch of things that like the middle Platonists were saying. And so they go, well, then there was discontinuity and then more discontinuity. And so therefore yeah. the Neoplatonists had to be very different. But rather what was happening was more so that Plotinus onwards were um, had basically gone back and tried to recover, uh, like, I guess, fidelity to the proper teaching. Because obviously it's not Plato kind of just coming up with it himself. As uh, what, What's really important to stress with Plato is that he is both a Pythagorean and a Norfist in a sense. And in, in, in a real sense, those two aren't particularly disjunct either. If you read something like yeah. uh, Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie's uh, Pythagorean Sourcebook and Library, it's very, it's very clear that these two traditions kind of have their express expression in Plato as a student of those traditions, um, tradition. Um, but he'll call them ancients, so I guess we'll keep using the plural. Um, but yeah, so... what? Cause, yeah, because I, I, I like literally the oldest manuscript that exists from Europe that we have, which was a copy of an older manuscript that was around Plato's time. Um, yeah. And it was, but it was just prior to Plato. It wasn't during Plato. It was kind of just prior to his writings. Um, that manuscript literally was an Orphic exegesis of, of the hymns, of the oh. poetry. And yeah, and it was so what you would call platonic but obviously it wasn't platonic because it was before plato was a thing so um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's 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 not platonic but it has the same fundamental kind of thing and it doesn't there's no disagreement there either which is the it shows that there's this yeah this tradition that has been inherited um from Plato, uh yeah to plato um and then from him has been this continuity from the orphic hymns which who knows how ancient those are um yeah exactly I and, think, and who they get inherited yeah. from and stuff like that it could go back even further so exactly yeah i mean like um i'll, I'll give a kind of catholic analog for our audience because uh i know most most people watching that's fine found this on twitter will probably like come from this background so very recently we had the the feast of our lady of mount carmel and with the carmelites you have a similar case with the neoplatonist relationship with Plato in the sense that you have like the original like uh, monastic communities at Mount Carmel uh, perhaps prior to um, the Crusades coming and taking back Mount Carmel you could go back to uh, the time of Elijah an interesting story here apparently uh, Pythagoras came and stayed at uh, Mount Carmel according to Yamblichus but that's that's a whole nother rabbit hole for another day so <laughs> but um, what what uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that when we have the Carmelite Reformation, uh, which is by, you know, spearheaded by St. Teresa of Avila, uh, she's accused of basically what the academics will accuse 
the Neoplatonists of, of discontinuity, right? The, the Carmelites of her time say, no, you, you're making all these radical innovations, but she's just going back to the sources. She's going back to the, like, how, uh, like, how, like, the religious life was supposed to be, in a sense. Um, and so I think that's very much what's gone hit on with uh, quote-unquote Neoplatonism. Uh, but I think the easiest way to establish the continuity between the two and see where everybody else in between goes wrong is uh, the Neoplatonists are basically Neopythagoreans. And so if you want to have somebody in between who mediates Pythagoreanism between Plato, who was very much a Pythagorean, and Plotinus and everybody else following after him, it'd be someone like Nicomachus of Gerasa uh, and his works on arithmetic. I don't know if he's in uh, before Plotinus, but I know that his work on arithmetic and all the rest of uh, the various other uh, Pythagorean works are uh, after Plato's time, there are many which are contemporary with Middle Platonists, and that would be the closest to a continued tradition that's kind of has fidelity to its roots. Yeah, no, no, just check. On. Nicomachus is definitely before Plotinus. 60 okay, so AD to 120. Yeah, I, I had I had my suspicions because I remember reading it in David Albertson's Mathematical Theologies when he was kind of sketching out like how it kind of progressed, and he kind of eventually brings it into the Renaissance. But that's that's going a bit too far. Anyhow, I think that's enough for the historical yeah. background. Let's let's kick it off with the tractate. Now, um, so it's on beauty, and this will be like to the <laughs> to the uninitiated, uh, perhaps we might say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. the, like beauty seems like uh just one of the more subpar philosophical questions. It's something that perhaps is up to taste or uh, preference and, and the like, which, you know, we kind of fall uh, in the modern era into thinking of beauty in the very uh, Protagorean sense in Plato's dialogues. You know, we have the sophists who always have like kind of the counterposing, uh, you know, uh, position, which is not filled with very much wisdom at all. And from Protagoras, you kind of get that dictum that like man is the measure of all things. And so we have now that beauty is just in the eye of the beholder, it's the same thing. But what Platonic tradition uh, will maintain quite strongly, and this will be maintained even in the competing traditions of Plotinus's own time. Like I'm, the Stoics won't say that like beauty is relative to the beholder. And the, I don't even think the Epicureans would say it if if they even touched on it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think they have. But, yeah. yeah, but. Uh, yeah, and obviously Aristotle and the Peripatetic schools wouldn't have said, no, it doesn't exist. They very much were yeah, into it having a real essence and having a what makes it what it is and not something else. Um, so I, I think this is one of the big tragedies of the modern era. It's that this transcendental, which is a uh, concept we'll get into in a second, uh, is of the big three, which would be good, truth and beauty, completely ne neglected. Right. You have the good, which typically people will ascribe with uh, that which is moral, uh, that which is concerned with virtue in the practical life. We have truth, which is, you know, that which is and which is not. Uh, and then we go, OK, so then what's the proper object of beauty? And this is where really the treatise from Plotinus starts. It starts with an academic discussion and criticism of various contemporary accounts of beauty. And the search for an adequate concept of what beauty is and what causes beauty inextricably leads us away from physically reductive explanations towards a transcendent cause. Uh, so this transcendent cause can only be reached by a process that is at once rigorously, rigorously rational. It's not just experiential. You felt pleasure. Now you've kind of uh, like grasped beauty in some sense. And, and perhaps that, that's one aspect of it, but it's not exhaustive. Uh, but at the same time, it's deeply personal. And this is why... Plotinus' tractate on beauty becomes really important. It it delves into kind of looking into oneself and rediscovering true beauty through the different, I guess you could say, gradations of the self as it kind of ascends the gradations of reality or the, gra the grades of being, um, properly speaking, as Proclus would say. Uh, and no one can do this for us. This is something, an, act an activity that one must kind of endeavor to do uh, it principally by themselves and it's not like 
it's something you do entirely alone. It is definitely something social, and it's not something you can do without mediating divinity, as any Neoplatonist, sorry, late Platonist would say. That's that's going to annoy me now, <laughs> like, <laughs> because it's such a uh, integrated part of my vocabulary, whatever. But yeah, it is somewhat. If someone has a, a dual spirit, a duality that ends up being reconciled by a necessity, uh, that you know, kind of this treatise climaxes in. So many of Plotinus's treatises uh follow this pattern of like you have a philosophical discourse leading to a personal discovery uh through exaltation right um and as opposed to maybe the the aristotelian sense which is uh much more kind of uh debate structured almost uh, and it's not like Plotinus isn't in the same context. He's all, he's he's you know, he's in academies. He's responding to problems and questions that people have, you know, given to him. Just as you know, perhaps we could think of Aquinas doing the same thing in the like in the academy, but uh, rather the universities, the academy with the other be the other way around, whatever. Um, but yeah, so I think to the first thing will, which will be really important to establish is okay so why exactly is beauty not just relativistic why is it not just something that's pleasing to the eye and therefore just to one person but it differs to another why isn't it just taste um and this is where we have to get to the fundamental epistemological claim of platonic thought as well as i guess as well as aristotelianism and i guess it it does yeah it does run from Plato all the way down through all of Platonism, obviously, insofar as they hold fast to it. I mean, like, this is another point where it's like the, the Middle Platonists even reject the, uh, like, someone like Numenius of Aphemia almost became like a representationalist, uh, I believe. Uh, but yeah. Um, well, this is, this is like, this is what happens when you lack the, like, proper, um, what's the term? <laughs> Initiation into understanding. Yeah like yeah. the ideas and how they interact with um you know the form of themselves and then also the form as they are that we can see through sense and and all this kind of stuff like without having like a proper understanding of that the epistemology becomes wonky and then you yeah. kind of end up falling into the kind of you know <laughs> heresies of representationalism <laughs> and 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 whatever like it, you know where it becomes kind of relativistic and yeah. you end up becoming Kant or someone like yeah yeah exactly um but yeah so i guess the the claim is that runs from plato down to aquinas and actually for plotinus himself is that like uh, i guess you can break it into two parts where it's like a what is what exists what has been is inherently given to thought and you can kind of Let's formulate this in a Pythagorean, a Pythagorean manner, actually, and say that all that is under limit is intelligible. If it is something and not something else, it's inherently limited to be that and not another. To be a dog is to be what a dog is and not, you know, what a dog is not. And therefore, it's inherently limited to being that stable identity or essence, right? And Aquinas will uh, repeat this idea uh, and... Um, basically saying like uh the the latin uh famously is ends as proprium objectum intellectus being is the proper object of intellect right um and then the second part would be that true knowledge only occurs when the knower becomes identical with the object of knowledge that is in a direct and personal encounter and this is the kind of platinian response to skepticism of the flavor that we can only like know the object as external to ourselves and therefore we only have an image of it and not of the thing itself which is what we call representationalism like five seconds ago and yeah it's as uh alexander said it's kant um in a sense and so what it means to become identical with the object of knowledge is that i guess for the scholastics they'd say look you have the agent intellect which can comprehend essences uh the what's the intelligible whatness of something um, and so and I, I feel like Proclus uh, gives similar expressions to, uh, I'm not entirely sure with Plotinus because I haven't gotten that far, but basically it runs uh, the case of, okay, so the ver there are various powers of the intellect. You have memory and you have uh, imagination. So you can like, 
if, if you have like a triangle that you've written on the whiteboard, this is something I actually was talking about <laughs> to Alexander <laughs> probably a week ago or something, where it's like, okay, so you've got the drawn triangle in front of you. Uh, you have uh, the powers of sense, which allow you to see like the black drawn thing on the, you know, the, on the wall in front of you, right? And you can see that it's kind of wonky in one of the corners. It doesn't properly connect at the top corner or something. Um, and it's like, okay, but you know that it is a triangle and you can then recall what triangles look like through your memory. That's one of your operations. And the other op operation would be like, okay, now I've got that triangle in my head. I can like imagine different types and kind of generate them in my mind what other triangle things look like. And that'd be your imagination or uh, your fantasy uh, with the PH as yeah, like the, the funny thing is like when you like properly think about it is that you know a triangle that's truer than the triangle that you see yeah like and and that's the kind of foundation of it where when you have experiences of things or whatever um you you come to know something that's truer about them than the thing that you see which is yep. kind of an oxymoron if, or not an oxymoron, what's the word? It's kind of like a reverse of the Kantian understanding where they think that the thing itself um, that, that you come to know is is like not there is a greater reality that you don't know. But yeah. like in, re in reality, you end up knowing something greater because, like, you know, you have the archetype of things that you come to grasp and you could apply it in certain different situations that you've never actually experienced it before, but you just because this is just the function of thought that you're capable of doing that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so a crooked triangle. I mean, no one has seen the perfect triangle, but everyone knows what that looks like. Like, yep. so it, it's, it's, and I mean, it's not to claim that, and this is what I find that a lot of people kind of get hung up on when they try to understand this, um, is that it's not to claim that just by seeing something, suddenly you have perceived the perfection of that being and <laughs> you know it perfectly yeah, right? yeah. It, it, it's, that's not the claim the claim is that what you see and what then is you know in your mind is at least a partial like a like a partial uh what's it, it's a part of that superior being essentially yeah. and you know and we can get to know more of that being in, in its ideal form by investigating the image that we're receiving um but if that image is real it's like it's not like it's like it's sorry the the idea is real and that's yeah. the being that is being integrated essentially where you have like the agent the intelligent agent that's integrating itself with ideas it's yeah you're you're creating a more complete idea which naturally it has to already exist in order for you to even go on the endeavor to create a complete idea because otherwise there wouldn't be parts for you to gather together like <laughs> so yeah, exactly. it's, it's, it's so there is this kind of like there is a graded like understanding it's not a claim that you immediately receive the fullness of everything otherwise that would just be obviously nonsense but the idea is that you are actually interacting with something that's real not like um you know you're not you're not coming to know something that isn't actually real which is just in when it when it's set out like that it's obviously like ridiculous ridiculous i was gonna say something else i don't know if we can we've already sworn on this I mean, it was good it's just retarded like <laughs> uh, <laughs> all, i was, I was like, trying to think, like have we like swore already? i'm pretty sure you did so i'm gonna say it, retarded um yeah. because <laughs> like you can't like come to know something that doesn't exist so like, oh, no, but it's not how it works. You know, things exist, but we just can't know them. Okay, so what are we coming to know then? Like, yeah, but anyway, just not to diverge so much. But, um, but yeah, so I find that it's important to remember that it's not that you're coming into a perfect knowledge of something, but you are coming into a knowledge of something. Yeah. I think and, um, uh, I'm glad you mentioned before investigation because I think we can let's let's use a practical example. You've got that triangle on the whiteboard in front of you, right? It's like, okay, you somehow, uh, I don't know how, you don't know what a triangle is. and you know you're standing with you know your friend and you're like, you gesture at the the, the shape, the, the drawn image on the whiteboard, and you're like, what is that? 
and then he's like oh it's a triangle okay you have a name it's like okay but like what is it what does it do what, like what are its properties why why do i need to know what it is and you kind of as you ask questions you have more and more revealed to you about it from someone who already knows but then eventually you'll get to a point of proper understanding of oh okay it's a shape with three sides and it's you know it's got the, like the 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 interior angles will sum to 180 etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and then once you've grasped kind of like by kind of investigating more aspects of it you come to what the thing itself is and then you're able to kind of make that recognition wherever else it's present um but it's it's something that um, Plato will stress is kind of recollective knowledge, but it's in the sense that like it's recollective, not in the sense that you knew it, it perfectly prior to the experience, like you knew what the triangle was and then you forgot and then you've been kind of brought back to knowing it, but rather it's the very essence of what it what a triangle is exists prior to the judgment of this being being a triangle uh, and not something else. And so it's it's kind of Re receding back into the a priori right the prior to the judgment the prior to the kind of uh the cognition of the thing in front of you that allows you to understand its essence and that's why we'd say that like the, the platonic uh, the eidos the platonic forms if you will uh, uh in this sense uh there, you could say that the, there are some, some people say that they are innate ideas. I don't know if you want to say they're innate because it sounds like they're like in your head, and but that's, uh, but they're they're it's better to say they're given. They're they're given to thought in this fundamental way, but it requires uh, this investigation to uncover what's already with the activity of mind. Uh, and so if we want to come back to representationalism, Platonism does get accused of this. It does get accused of being representationalism. And the kind of erroneous formulation goes like this. The platonic forms are, are numinal uh, kind of uh, objects whereby you have the perfect triangle in this hypostasized heaven. And all we have access to is shadowy reflections in the form of the drawn triangle and the form of the, you know, the triangular uh, sandwich slice and the uh, the triangle here, there, and everywhere that we have physically, and so what uh, the, the accusation just amounts to. Okay, but the, the actual triangle in and of itself, you don't have access to. It's like no, no, no. It's it's the opposite. You the very possibility of pointing out that these things that you've just identified in the real world are triangle is because you have triangularity itself as I guess an a priori idos, an a priori a, a priori idea that allows you for the allows you to recognize them as sharing this common identity. Yeah, and there's in this presence, like this is the other thing, like triangularity is a presence, and that yep. presence, as to use like Platinian kind of terminology, it emanates from triangle. Yeah. So it's it's triangles like the triangularity that is present among us of um you know triangles that aren't very good looking um that in itself is the presence of triangles so to speak um and like and and, and you know that it has to be kind of ruled by some supreme triangle yeah <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise you know you can't draw a triangle in a way that doesn't cohere with the idea of a triangle like you can't draw a triangle that has you know, an internal um, sum of degrees that goes to 200 degrees or something like that. That's not possible. Or yeah. you can't have it less than that. Um, it has to have three sides. And you, you can talk about whether that's semantics or not, but I think that will clear up as we kind of talk about beauty, um, yeah. where it's not just a matter of semantics. It's a matter of, um, of like, necessity because we live in a lower realm that is kind of under the subject of necessity um yeah not that there's necessity there there being the divine realm but as a descendant of them there is necessity on us so yep. yeah so it's it in a sense it's like the uh triangularity itself where does it subsist 
it, to ask where is to unfortunately try and put it in somewhere that's temporal at worst or spatial, which is oftentimes the implication of a where, but it doesn't really, it doesn't merely exist in a where because it's, uh, you, we'd say the triangularity just as with, I guess, anything that is related to number and geometry is eternal, um, which is like, so it, therefore it subsists, it subsists as present wherever there is triangularity in the draw, tri draw yeah, triangle like, and also with, with your yeah this, exactly yeah. where is the number one where is the number where are the where are the numbers and it's like then if if we say it's just kind of conceptualization or oh, they're just ideas in the mind they're just universally in every oh you're getting there. like yeah <laughs> it, it, it kind of it it eventually falls apart because you realize there is this kind of omnipresence of number but then we can't really say that it this given thing is like the number itself by itself because yeah. it's always yeah and so either it's heuristic and then uh you've tr problematized truth itself eventually that kind of doesn't work or it's eternal and then they're kind of like the this is the technical term the transcendental kind of conditions for for judgment where it's like and i use transcendental not in the sense that it's above and beyond which in a sense it is but not that doesn't capture it it's more so transcendental in the, uh, un unfortunately, in the weirdly Kantian sense, but it's not. It's in the manner in which he uses the word, not in like the sense that it's part of his philosophy in this important sense that's opposed to you know well, uh, non-representational. Like, it's the mind is God rather than <laughs> rather than humans. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's 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 he's got it incredibly backwards. But the point being is that it's the, for the possibility of of something we might say that it is transcendental in relation to. So just to close this bit off with representationalism, because it's important, otherwise we can't get to beauty. Um, if the kind of intentional objects of intellection are other than being eternal, um, you know, uh, this restricts us usually to sense images and internal concepts we generate from our imagination or what have you, memory. Um, but then, uh, the activity of intellect, uh, you know, what it knows as something as opposed to another, uh, you know, in its grasping of the intelligible whatness of a given object, as opposed to other mental faculties, as the memory and imagination I just mentioned a second ago, it will have to be able to compare the given sensible image it receives, say the drawn triangle on the whiteboard again, um, or the constructed images, perhaps recalling the, the the triangle or, you know, having it drawn in the head with the red pen instead, it'll have to be able to co um, compare these uh, with the corresponding intelligibles that kind of emanate from or represent, right? It'll have to compare it with triangularity to be like, oh, it's actually a triangle um, to know whether it's accurate or not. But if it can compare uh, the represented triangle on the whiteboard with triangularity itself, uh, it doesn't need uh, merely the representation itself. It's not like that is what knowledge is limited to. But if it can't know triangularity itself, then it can't know the sensible drawn triangle as being triangular. And so then the cognitive act would have something other than being, which would be really odd. And so that would be, you know, it'd be absurd because the very object of intellect is being. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, what like is this for being, as Parmenides liked to say, even though he butchered the rest of that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, so we we need to, this is where it comes to beauty, we need to conclude that what we have given to the senses allows us a real passage from them to their corresponding intelligibles. Like the drawn triangle allows us a real passage back to triangularity itself, Otherwise, they wouldn't. The drawn triangle wouldn't be intelligible as the determinate sense data of this geometric shape, as opposed to something else. And so, therefore, representationalism and conceptualism are both false. Um, and so, this, I guess, will we will yeah. Let's let's tie this more directly into into beauty now. Uh, so it's like okay, true knowledge is only possible when we become the object of knowledge where the transition to intellect marks kind of, I guess it marks the radical distinction that uh, Plotinus draws between the other operations of the soul and the intellect, and the scholastics do the same too. So this is why it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes triangularity. There is something, like there is a power in 
in the intellect, which we call the agent intellect of scholasticism, that in a sense becomes triangularity. So it is able to make these comparisons with things that display triangular triangularness i am just gonna butch that <laughs> triangularness uh, <okay. laughs> triangularness um so simply put when sensible beauty when beautiful things to our senses to the eyes to the touch to this to smell to taste whatever um when it does exist it's also found in things which are not purely sensible in nature and so the tractate begins we haven't even started it <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so basically we are going to ascend to the cause of sensible and non-sensible beauty. Are their causes different? Uh, because, because the former partakes in beauty and the, la the later, sorry, the latter is beautiful in and of itself. And so if we want to quote Plotinus to properly kick us off, like, I don't know, like half an hour into this, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> then what is it that has made us imagine say, bodies to be beautiful, or our hearing to assent to sounds as being beautiful? How can all the things that are directly concerned with the soul be beautiful? And is everything beautiful by one and the same beauty? Or is it, or is beauty one thing in the body and something else in another? And what could this, uh, these or this other thing be? Some things, for example, bodies, if we come back, are not beautiful from their own underlying substances, but by participation. Whilst uh, others are beauties themselves, uh, such as the nature of virtue. Um, for the same bodies, sometimes appear beautiful and sometimes not, since their being bodies is different from their being beautiful. What then is that that is present to bodies that makes them beautiful? And so for Plotinus, the inquiry has to begin here. What is it that stirs the gaze of those who look and then turn and draw within themselves and makes them delight in what they see. And when we find this, Plotinus says, we will probably see the rest too, using it as a stepping stone. So what's the cause of sensible beauty? We find this, we'll be able to kind of find the cause of non-sensible beauty. But non-sensibles, that is, things that are intelligible, essences, the intelligible whatnesses of things, uh, that is... Uh, that is, uh, sorry, it's like, as beings as they are in themselves, they produce the sensibles. And so we have to say that we want to call it like the the idea of beauty, eternal beauty itself, whatever it is, when that's the whole point of this tractate to find out what it is, is what is the precondition that in a sense imparts what like true beauty to that which displays it. And so this is when we come to kind of various definitions of beauty that Plotinus is going to compete with. Um, and the most prominent one is the idea that uh, beauty is the symmetry of parts uh, to each other and to the whole with the addition of color. Now, this one is a definition that actually is present in Plato's dialogues from, I think, the sophist, but it's not something that Plato really concludes on. But it is um, also very stoic, and it's very much popularized by Cicero in his Tusculian Disputations, I think it was. Um, so what we need to do is basically establish that, and we have somewhat in the sense that things which are corporeal and which have color can't be reducible to them being what beauty is, right? They require something which is the you know beauty itself, which allows for us to co which allows for us to cognize this or that body with color to display beauty in some sense, right? Uh, but if we were to take this stoic account, uh, then only compound objects would be beautiful, uh, but they're not the the simpler parts. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, yeah, probably like the, the, the like the straightforward kind of like Plotinus like very quickly basically shows how symmetry is irrelevant um and it's most clearly seen in yeah color itself light is generally considered to be beautiful like you know you have um lightning and he mentions um gold and also music is natural to that like where's the symmetry in these things and um and why is it that Color itself has a certain charm, but then, you know, it, it doesn't have that symmetry necessarily. 
And I think that it, it shows how um, symmetry itself, to quote directly, um, uh, symmetry itself owes its beauty to a remoter principle. And um, yeah, so I think yeah, exactly. like, you know, the, 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 the view of symmetry is because I guess there's this very like, I probably should have like checked the Greek and stuff like that to look at it, but there's probably like a kind of communication in that of thinking of it very visually. Yeah, um, I was thinking of like a statue where you have like, okay, well, you've you've kind of sculpted this thing. It, it displays beauty. How? Oh, well, it has symmetry, which makes it kind of look nice. And without the symmetry, it kind of falls apart as this kind of artistic object. And if we add color, it kind of has more beauty. And it's like, okay, if you apply this idea, then well, we have kind of one heuristic for what beautiful things might be, but it it's not exhaustive in any sense. And that, well, that's the big thing as well, like what it might be. And that... Symmetry in itself doesn't actually bring anything into being beautiful. Um, yeah. There's something that must like lie before the symmetry is applied in order for it to bring something into beauty. Because like he kind of, he doesn't mention it directly, but he does later on mention how there's this inner ideal of a house that an architect has. And then he puts it in, he, put, he brings into order all of these different, you know, parts and constructs the house and that's the beautiful thing and you know the thing is that the symmetry that might have beauty in that um if he constructed the house out of like dung or something like that it can be symmetrical <laughs> but it doesn't matter because the parts that constitute it are not good right They're literal and, shit like <laughs> yeah it's, it's literally you shit and, shit, you're not gonna get anything better than shit yeah so, <laughs> so it's like just because it's symmetrical doesn't actually mean anything, even though we must, like, it, you know, everyone knows that, you know, a symmetrical kind of shape and symmetrical construction is a pleasing to look at, but it, yeah. it do, it's not that in itself. And, yeah, and Plotinus does very quickly basically just show how nonsensical it, it is to focus on that as the source of beauty. Yeah, exactly. I think... The, the I think the best and most eye-opening example that he uses, which sheds a lot of light on how important beauty as a um, how do I put it as uh, as a it's transcendental a, yeah. is, uh, is when he applies. Okay, let's have a look at how symmetry works in even in propositions and maybe even moral commandments, where it's like, okay, well. There might be an accordance of an I, an entire identity where there is nothing but ugliness. That proposition that you know honesty is merely generous artlessness chimes with the most perfect harmony with the proposition that morality means weakness of will. Uh, the accordance is complete between these completely morally egregious assertions, except they don't combine into something beautiful that is something that is true and that could lead one to live a kind of uh, fulfilled and uh, uh, kind of blessed life. It's not possible. Uh, but these two things are in concordance with each other. They display symmetry, but they don't display moral beauty, which is important because this is where it comes to the idea of beauty actually having scope, right? It's not just things that are given to the senses, which then, oh, we're just finding the precondition for there being beautiful things to the senses. Beauty itself, uh, especially in late antiquity and especially through Catholic theology, is always seen as having this much larger scope that we could speak of the beautiful soul. Uh, the morally uh, upright person is morally beautiful. Uh, and it it's so then again, if we look at something like uh, a given virtue, right? It's like, okay, this person has prudence, or it's like, well, prudence itself, like foresight, doesn't necessarily have symmetry. Where are the parts that have symmetry in the bodily sense here? There, there aren't. And so Plotinus makes the point early on that virtue is something which doesn't have material shape that could be symmetrical, but yet it's non-corporeal and it's uh, at least conceptually simple. And so if you were to have this beauty as symmetry with the addition of color, uh, or beauty as in any sense merely just materially reducible you have to exclude you have to exclude all sorts of applications of beauty and the range of its application narrows just just ridiculously uh, which is kind of i mean it's very annoying at least for like common parlance it's quite nice to be able to talk about like this person is a you know 
a beautiful person not merely in the sense that they're pleasing to look at when you look respectfully but because you know talking to them gives you a sense of delight and then you're like why does why does you know being with this person give me such delight like you know they're always kind to me they they're always quite joyful they always kind of know how to act in the right manners which are towards my benefit even if they chastise me and it's like okay well it's because they have this moral beauty and so this is where we have to then uh for a uh, uh, moral necessity almost uh go beyond any conception of beauty as merely materially reducible um so i think that's i think that's really uh it for the first part of the tractate out of or i don't know how many nine parts so let's keep going <laughs> so, so if we if we continue right um what Plotinus will say in the second part can kind of be summed up as this. The soul is immediately aware of beauty in physical objects before recognizing and comparing it with the form of beauty within the soul. And similarly, it recoils from ugliness. Uh, and that is really if it has good judgment. Now, there is a kind of common sense in which people have that they kind of instinctively recoil from certain things. But, you know, that sense can be kind of dulled uh, by, oh, I don't know, like a shit education uh, and years of media consumption. And um, I guess I won't go into the other causes because that'll start a completely different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, through uh, improper tutelage, we might say, uh, people kind of are lessened from that disgust reflex uh, and they don't recoil as much from ugliness. Um, but the soul will always kind of rejoice in beauty, why? Because it's similar to its nature, which is something that Plotinus would stress. Um, and so he will then argue uh, that uh, ugliness is like the absence of form, and then that it's form that provides unity in complex objects and uniformity in simple ones. And so to just kind of dive a little bit further into that, Plotinus will basically say that Undoubtedly, this principle, beauty itself, exists. It is something that is perceived at the first glance, something which the soul names as from ancient knowledge, as in, you know, it's uh, ontologically prior in this really fundamental sense. It's, it's a temporal metaphor. Uh, and recognizing beauty, it, it welcomes it and enters into unison with it. Um, and then, but the soul then uh, that falls in with the ugly at once shrinks within itself and denies that thing, and turns away from it, not accordant, or is, um, and is resenting it. Now that is the the upright soul, we might say, in the kind of Bonaventurian sense. Like if you, if the soul is, and it's if if the human person uh, doesn't have right judgment and has the, I guess, all sorts of disorders in habit and taste, uh, they'll definitely find disgusting things pleasing. And I think the the greatest example of this would be something like perverse pornography. Uh, but I don't want to start that conversation either because that's something for another time. So uh, I think what I think the important point here that uh, Plotinus really brings up is the idea of the trace. And so it basically says that the he basically points and uh, not explicitly in this part, but later on um, that there is a kind of trace of this kinship of the soul with beauty and that there is the kind of trace of beauty that we can kind of follow and then find uh beautiful the the beautiful itself well and it's so it's basically like you know the, the foundation of it is the likeness where yeah. you know he talks about how soul seeks to be you know to come into communion with what it is like and when the soul has become amicable to things which are um lower um and generally that the reason for that is because it's living life by um or living life in the mind which has war rooted itself in the activity of the body um which is naturally you know congenial with disorder and and um and ugliness the kind of like you know temptation towards like literally even like pornography or whatever is that this is the root this is the trace that exists for these lower things that, you know, the beauty perceived is far lower than 
the beauty available but because this is the natural amicable kind of thing to the person who's experiencing it um who desires it and seeks union with it this is why they become addicted to what is effectively in its true form ugly um or in yeah. its tr in its true in, in how it not true form what's the word it's um, properly in its, in its in its, its current reality like yeah um, yeah, if, if the mind properly conforms to its objects, then it won't see things which are inherently like that ugly as uh, inordinately beautiful. With, yeah, with and and this is kind of like I mean, this whole basically falls into even like the whole transsexual thing. Like, <laughs> here we go. Like, there's this yes. like there's this seek of communion and union with something that they have idolized to such an extreme that because they're so rooted in the body they think that the, the way to getting to it is through the body so they have to yeah. alter the body and really and... to do violence to it which is yeah, even like more it, part of the disorder to... right yeah. you have to kind of like go at it in with like and actually literally literally mutilate it and put it well, into it, further disorder it's... so you can sculpt yeah. it into something better yeah so that's and and this is just basically the consequence of atheism and obsession yeah so um you know, like I, I genuinely do not believe anyone who's a transsexual actually is religious. I do not believe it because the way that they conceive of things is evidently fundamentally disordered. Um, <laughs> unless yeah. they, uh, you know, they decide to become religious later on. But then if they are, then I highly doubt it's it. In spite of that, it's entirely. It's yeah, it's, it's exactly it's, like, um, yeah. So anyway, to continue um, from there. OK, uh, so. We touched on the idea that there was uh, the the absence of form is is inherently ugly, right? So well, I'll quote him. Uh, so Plotinus basically says that we hold that all the loveliness in this world uh, comes by communion in ideal form, and so but where ideal form has entered, it has grouped and coordinated what from a diversity of parts has come to be a unity. It has rallied confusion into cooperation. It has made the sum of one harmonious coherence. For the idea is a unity, and what it molds must come to unity as far as multiplicity may. Um, and so the illustration he gives is the one of the house, which you gave before, which was, uh, you know, thus, for an illustration, there is the beauty conferred by a, a craftsman of all a house with all its parts, and the beauty which some natural quality may give to a single stone. But it's uh, the different qualities and uh, we might say degrees of beauty in the parts, which are then put into a harmony, which allows for this multiplicity of parts to have beauty, right? Uh, but then in in things which are singular, it's it's this kind of uniformity which allows them to be beautiful. And th think about the stone if it's kind of lumpy and ugly, it's going to be a bit hard to kind of fashion something beauty out, beautiful out of it. Uh, but if it's kind of, you know, smooth, uniform, has this nice color, then it's like, okay, this displays some kind of beauty and now integrating it in a in a whole to, that needs to have and display beauty is going to be a little bit easier. Uh, but st this still hasn't addressed uh, particularly what uh, uh, beauty itself is, where we're still kind of following the trace here. Um, and so what Plotinus will really concludes very strongly on and this is uh i guess what once we get to um uh, paragraph paragraph three no, you can call it chapter three right we've done one and two let's go to three we're about a third of the way in now mm. uh and that's an hour into this <laughs> so here we go uh the higher part of the soul will uh joins with the lower in recognizing beauty that is there's kind of like concordance of the entire human person when it recognizes beauty everything is operating in its right accord right uh, the soul entire is enlisted to support its judgment uh but then the soul compares the embodied form uh uh without mass with the form that is already in the soul again it's that kind of okay it's the the a priori idea allowing for the proper cognizance of what is actual actually beautiful we can come back to the uh, the architect of the house uh and to 
he uses it a bit more strongly where he's like, okay, on what principle does the architect, when he finds the house standing before him, correspondent with his inner ideal of a house, pronounce it beautiful? Is it not the house before him, the stones apart? Is the inner idea stamped upon the massive exterior matter, the indivisible exhibited in diversity? Um, and so from there... Uh, the the embodied form also includes co uh, color caused by light, but light is incorporeal. And so when we come to the idea of beauty maybe perhaps residing a bit uh, more in its cause uh, in the incorporeal, uh, I, Plotinus goes on to kind of uh, uh, go into a little bit of a digression about the, the four elements, where he goes, okay, well, out of the four elements, fire, earth, water, and air, uh, fire itself is splendid beyond all material bodies, holding the rank of ideal principle to the other elements, making ever upwards the subtlest and sprightliest of all bodies, as very near to the unembodied, itself alone abiding no other, all the others penetrated by it. For they take warmth, but this is a, never cold. It has color primarily. They receive the form of color from it, hence the splendor of its light, the splendor that belongs to the idea." Um, and so we kind of have uh, an indication of where he's going here, where it's like, okay, so the so fire itself, the aspects of it, which he's kind of pointing towards, um, is that it is n inherently active, um, and it is the least dependent uh, of the elements, uh, in the sense that Earth is the most uh, con like conceptually passive. Um, and uh, water always takes the form that it, it finds itself in. Uh, but uh, fire will literally destroy various forms uh, upon contact and is, is not uh, kind of shaped and dependent upon exteriors. Um, and then I think the more interesting part is that you have an analogy with Eros and, and the flame, where it's like there's always this kind of upward motion towards... Um, uh, I guess th through the grades of being towards b the beautiful itself. So I think fire is probably a little bit less uh, an analog to beauty itself as it is to to the kind of uh, erotikoi, which would be, I think, the proper Greek word for the one who is like a disciple of beauty in the sense that he has the, this kind of yearning for that which is beautiful in and of itself. Um, so... Uh, I mean, like before I continue, do you you want to say anything about part three or? Uh, not really. Um, no. Nah. <laughs> okay. I, like, right. I looked through it like earlier, like when I was reading through, it, I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, it doesn't really talk about anything. He's just more giving like examples again of um of how um he, he can you know understand it, but yeah, no, I I I think we can continue. All right, let's go to four, because four and five is where it starts getting good. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah, okay, I'll keep calling the chapters. Uh, chapter four basically says that transcendent beauty is not visible in and of itself to sense perception, uh, and it can be spoken of uh, only by those who have kind of fostered their own internal beauty, if we think about right judgment and the ability to make uh, you know proper discernments and not be attracted to that which is actually ugly. Uh, I, I think it'll be far harder for the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the meth addict uh, to make judgments about what is properly beautiful compared to, I don't know, like uh, someone living a monastic life or something who's got all of his faculties and, and you know, uh, powers of the soul, I'm using that scholastic terminology again, uh, in right order. Um, and so... The soul, taking no help from the organs, sees and proclaims them. It's again, it's that a priori, a priori beauty uh, itself that is given to the agent intellect. Um, and here we uh, kind of come to one of the crux of the, the kind of one of the many cruxes of the arguments, which ties into eros again, which is, uh, it's where are we? It's uh, this is the spirit of beauty. Uh, this is the spirit that beauty must ever induce wonderment and a delicious trouble longing and love and a trembling that is all delight for the unseen all this may be felt as for the seen 
and this the souls feel for it every soul in some degree but those that are more uh deeply uh that are the more truly apt to this higher love just as all take delight in beauty of the body but uh not as stung as sharply and only those that feel the keener wound are known as lovers and so it's um it's the kind of proper love and yearning that uh, can draw someone up to the beautiful itself and i think this uh this tendency uh to conceive of beauty in both this inherently theological manner but also this inherently erotic manner is something that runs uh throughout i guess not all but most of catholic mysticism and definitely in the carmelites that i mentioned before i think saint Teresa of avila would have probably used one-to-one the language that plotinus used right here with feeling the wound and being that uh you know the prop the more kind of uh perfect lover uh, i'll see if i can find a quote while i read out the next bit uh but basically um <clears throat> where are we uh there's a peculiar aspect of the i, I guess you can call it the late and um antique reflection on beauty uh when it's ref- kind of related to divinity um and kind of obviously this necessitates abandoning uh, beauty is symmetry beauty is all sorts of other things because it doesn't work in theological context at all uh, and i think a really good example is to compare with somebody who was also very much influenced by plotinus directly and that's saint gregory of nyssa and he takes up the ideas in this tractate in a way that's uh, a little bit more erotic because he's commenting on the Song of Songs from the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with that book of scripture, it has uh, basically the bride uh, uh, kind of ready for, I guess you could say, nuptiality with the bridegroom, uh, but then is found kind of lost without the bridegroom, but naked, and then yet still requiring to go through further, I guess you could say, unveiling to be pure uh, for, you know, consummating the marriage. Um, and there's many out like there are many points of allegory here, um, and it's something I, there's there is just ridiculous amounts of le- like detail to that. So uh, just to pull on what's necessary here is that oftentimes this is read as either the bridegroom being uh, being God himself and the bride being uh, I, like the church. That's, I think, how um, St. Bernard of Clairvaux read it. And I think that's also how many of the Jews read it when said of the church, it's Israel. Um, And then with St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, which is far earlier than than Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, and with Origen, they'd read it as, oh, no, it's it's between God and the soul. And so the soul is kind of in the feminine position and yearning for the bridegroom who is inherently the masculine uh position because he's you have the receptive uh and the active and so you you would you, like you're there yearning to receive the graces from uh from divinity in a sense um and so um this is i think this is probably the only part where plotinus here is referred to uh i guess really I mean, he does mention it later but it's the strongest bit where he's ref- re- mentioned like emotion here and so he refers directly to pathos in in the greek and in doing so he adopts some terms which are linked to the conception of love as a mixture of pleasure and pain and in this view philosophically discussed by plato himself it it does kind of it i think it does go back to um like the lyric poets to homer and all the rest i I, I, i've seen that mentioned before um but Plato describes the kind of powerful emotions uh, aroused at the sight of beauty, and beauty is platonically the chief object of eros, and therefore these emotions can be classified as that of love. Um, And so I think what would be interesting now is to tie it back to Plato's Philebus. And so uh, basically the dialogue section, which is relevant here, is Philebus 46a, and Socrates is basically asking, so do you recognize greater pleasure in life uh, one that is given to excesses, and I do not say more pleasures, but pleasures that exceed by their force and intensity, than in a moder in a moderate life. And think carefully about it before you answer. And Protarchus, his current uh, interlocutor, basically says, "Well, I quite understand what you're after, and I see a huge difference. The moderate people somehow always stand under the guidance of the proverbial maxim, nothing too much.' 
and they obeyed it. And you consider like the golden mean. Virtue was always in the mean, as Aristotle might say. But as to foolish people, are those given uh, to debauchery, the excesses of their pleasure drive them near madness and to shrieks of frenzy. Socrates says, good, but if this is how it stands, then it is obvious that it is in some vicious state of the soul and not in virtue that the greatest pleasures as well as the greatest pain, pains have their uh, have their origin, uh, obviously. And so we must pick out some of them and find out what characteristics of theirs um, made us uh, call them the greatest. Uh, and so basically they go in trying to uh, ex uh, explore the emotions and what makes them great in one sense or another, but what necessarily has to be concluded on uh, is that what makes them, what makes one of the emotions properly great is not just sheer immensity uh, either, but there is a kind of far nobler pleasure to be derived from apprehending the beautiful. And so it is the erotic condition, yearning, as opposed to the counterposed state of the vicious soul that can potentially bring it about the greatest pleasures, not just you know, oh, well, we go into the excesses of this disordered kind, and then you go into madness, as Protarchus just said. Uh, but if you have the upright soul, if you have, you know, all your faculties uh, in good standing, if you have good judgment, then you can derive greater pleasure from apprehending be the beautiful in divinity. Uh, and uh, here an excess can actually be had, but you can't really call it an excess because there's no, there's no too much of prop like the like the beautiful itself uh and so one kind of has to really conceive of greatness properly first and foremost um uh, and i think that's that for chapter four but um uh yeah it again it's that there's this necessity of having this moral up uprightness and uh kind of uh prudence practical wisdom so before you can uh, ascend and then you can keep ascending uh, and then you can't really you don't have there's no point at which you can uh you know okay now you've had enough of drinking from the chalice of beauty like you can keep drinking you can just get drunk on that and that that won't impede your soul the sense uh but that's really what i had to say there i saw an interesting analog with you know on the unseen maybe felt a scene with hebrews 11 1 and romans 120 but that's I guess, yeah, like, that's that's really it, because I really want to do uh, Chapter 5. Did you have anything to say, Alexander? Well, I just, like, yeah, like, I mean, um, probably the one of the big things that I always have to draw from, because, I mean, naturally, the context of these writers is within Hellenism mm. um, and the, their traditions. So, like, a lot of, like, the kind of thought that because he, he specifically kind of talks about it a lot um, in his tractate on love, where he refers to Aphrodite. Yep. Um, but they, in this case, for example, um, there's the uh, the story from Ovid about um, Pygmalion, I think oh, it's yeah. pronunciation, um, you go right. <laughs> where he basically, um, he's an exceedingly, you know, he's a very like good looking guy um and he's a sculptor and but he's so disgusted by the immorality of the women who are um living on, on on cyprus and so he ends up falling in love with the um ivory sculpture that he was like making of aphrodite and that because of his piety and his um devotion aphrodite brings the statue to life um and i think it's kind of like this reference of how it is this devotion to beauty but not the beauty of immorality i guess because he yeah. could have had any woman on the island essentially like because he was very handsome but he was insistent in that he was found the immorality disgusting and he, in and this is the kind of like um you know the grades of aphrodite that we see in later on that he talks about of the Aphrodite Urania and the Aphrodite Pandemos, um, where you have the the heavenly Aphrodite and you have the um, common Aphrodite, as you could say, or the Aphrodite of all yeah. peoples. And it's this Aphrodite Urania, which is kind of calling people to be of a higher, um, to seek the higher beauty and to forgo the more base kind of 
beauties that you know that lie down there so i guess what we can see from that is this he more goes into it in number in chapter five um but it is that kind of loftier vision and loving of the ideal over the very more base kind of um sense uh vision i guess so um yeah like it, it's kind of like that um uh where we're not you know we're not experiencing beauty in the sense bound life i guess to use specifically the term he uses mm. um and because especially because i guess a statue is, is is still kind of like a i guess that you could say it's like a virtue in that like the splendor of virtue is still actualized within the world um but it, it is it is a still kind of a transcendent reference i guess you could say um so i mean this is this is generally how hellenic myth always kind of depicts these things is that there's this great number of different kinds of myths that describe different grades of reality and yep. this is one of them where it kind of applies directly here so yeah, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that, um, no, especially cool. in the context of what we're talking about. Nice, nice, nice. All right, yeah, as as you said, this the chapter five is is like that that's this is the big one, uh, to be honest. Where it's and I, I guess we'll we'll give it a little summary first before we jump into it. It's like Plotinus says that we must examine the uh experience of transcendent beauty in others in ourselves by in a sense, shedding ourselves from merely uh, the physical body. No, it's not the sense that you know, like you ast astral projection, or you die, and that you're you've like been kind of, you know, uh, dismembered. Like the soul has been dismembered from the body. But in a sense, it's uh, it's it's rather it's kind of detachment. I think is probably the best way to put it. Uh, not being kind of drawn to to base things, and then these beauties will be found to be completely. Uh, you know, beauty itself will be completely incorporeal and property of the soul will be presided over by intellect in so doing. But what makes all these things beautiful, um, the, the answer, the what is beauty, is that they are identical with being, right? And it seems like a lackluster response at first, but it becomes a lot more obvious and quite compelling as we kind of explore that definition. And so basically as we identify, like I kind of come to truth, it'll help us further identify this beauty. If we are also understand in the negative, what ugliness is uh, in, in further detail. And so ugliness in the soul is something that is added from the outside, which dr uh, drags it away to the external and corporeal. And we have to kind of remove this accretion to regain our original purity and beauty. And I come back to the Song of Songs where the bride is, even though she's uh, naked out on the streets, she's shedded everything of her own uh, so she can have a union with the, with the bridegroom. Uh, she's stopped by guards and then they still remove another veil because she had perhaps inordinate desires as well. And so you had to be further purified uh, kind of in this almost alchemical sense so that like the, you know, the soul can be intermingled with the pure uh, by becoming like the pure in itself. And this is where uh, I think the, I think one of the best bits of this entire tractate comes from Plotinus where he says, so what is it that awakens all this passion? No shape, no color, no grandeur of mass. All is for a soul something whose beauty rests upon no color. For the moral wisdom the soul enshrines in all other hueless splendors of the virtues. It is that you find in yourself or admire in another loftiness of spirit, righteousness of life, disciplined purity, courage of the mag majestic face, gravity, modesty that, glow that goes fearless and tranquil and passionless and shining down upon all the light of godlike intellection. All these noble qualities are to be reverenced and loved, no doubt, but what entitles them to be called beautiful? They exist. They manifest themselves to us. Anyone that sees them must admit that they have the reality of being, and it is not real being, and, and, is, not re, and is not real being really beautiful. 
Um, and so when we we have this definition that uh, the beautiful is real being, uh, to be intelligible is to be beautiful, um, in a sense. Uh, but then if we go and then in the negative to uh, shed more light on this positive definition, um, the true, like, uh, the true ugly thing uh, then is to be dissolute, unrighteousness, uh, you know, teeming with all sorts of loss, torn by internal discord, uh, beset by fears of cowardice and envy, enviness and pettiness and uh, thinking in its little thought all that it has of the perishable and the base, uh, perverse in all of its impulses and a friend of unclean pleasures, living the life of abandonment to bodily sensation and delighting in its deformity, which uh, reminds me again of that classic uh, uh, episode from uh, uh, Augustine's Confessions where he's delighted in stealing the pears that he doesn't give a shit about. These are shit pears. He doesn't like the taste of them, but he's just done it because he delighted in the act of stealing, not because it was injurious to, person he's, uh, to a person he didn't like. He didn't really care about his neighbor either. It was kind of dispassionate ab about it, but it was delighting in the evil act itself. And that's... And this is what we were just talking about a little bit earlier as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's the delighting and deformity, which is like the, the kind of the closest thing we, we can get to true ugliness. Because obviously what that deformity is and the sheer amount of delight that one can take in it, you can, I think, yeah, uh, the, the realm of pornography uh, kind of sheds kind of this hideous light on how far more deformed and perverse things can get. And the fact that one can delight in things which are more perverse one after another uh, definitely shows us that there is potentially no real definite end as to where ugliness stops. But we definitely do know some, like, like where, like, I guess, beauty then lies. And it's not there. It's in the complete opposite direction in that which is, true and that which is kind of in concordance if oh i mean actually no let's use a musical term in cadence uh with that which is morally good uh and righteous and perfect um uh where is it and so i think um okay i mentioned the bit about the unveiling uh where are we it's yeah it's it supervenes on the soul right ugliness is something that is extraneous to it these bad habits these uh, these kind of addictions, these uh, perverse inclinations of things which are to be detached and shed from, which is, again, yes, yeah, something that you see through all of Catholic mysticism, especially someone like uh, John of the Cross or uh, Meister Eckhart. You, you have this idea that, like, in a sense, good works rid you not only of the good work and the fact that you've completed the work and then it's over, but you've also kind of scraped away uh, at, at yourself of what is impure, or unclean, and not uh, worthy of uh, um, of divinity. And so, in trying to become like God, uh, you have to uh, kind of become detached to that which would frustrate this movement of your soul. And so, and to do so, to become more uh, godlike is to become more beautiful. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Again, it's very alchemical as well. It's and I think no, there's a bit where Plotinus actually makes it al alchemical. Quickly well, he, he explicitly mentions like the mysteries, and um, like yeah, like he says this is in chapter seven, but oh, um, yeah. so it's just a bit of a skip forward. But like he, he says, like um, you know, therefore we must ascend again towards the good, the desire of every soul. Um, to attain it is for those that will take the upward path, who will set all their forces towards it, who will divest themselves of all that we have put in our descent. So to those that approach the holy celebrations of the mysteries, which is referring to the Orphic mysteries and, and um, you know, all the Dionysian mysteries, um, there are appointed purifications and the laying aside of the garments worn before and the entry in nakedness until passing on the upward way, all that is other than the God, each in the solitude of himself shall behold that solitary dwelling existence, the apart, the unmingled, the pure, that mm -hmm. from which all things depend, for which all look and live and act and know the source of life and of intellection and of being. Um, so there's that kind of like symbolic, like stripping of the 
you know, clothing to basically kind of like, you know, represent that um, shedding of the, you know, the, the, the things that kind of tie us to the the realities of the world or the realities of matter, which are ultimately steeped and mixed um, in, in, in ugliness. But then in order to attain the beauty, there is this process of purification um, and it is to become as you said, more like God um, and to become more like the beautiful. Mm. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is kind of, as I said, kind of skipping forward, his, his sixth chapter is pretty small anyway, but, um, yeah. but yeah, like, it's it's very much a purifying process and and that's the kind of interesting thing, I guess, about it is understanding it as a purifying process because it then represents that the soul itself is already in a state of having some of that nature um even though it may mm. be muddied it's kind of like his example was that gold has been mingled with other matter this is the the example he gives in chapter five where yeah. it's uh the gold is degraded when it is mixed with earthly earthy particles so it's kind of like this yeah purification process and um and that there is this intrinsic value that's hidden within the soul, but it needs to be purified and brought out, I suppose you could say. Um, but obviously the process is not through the physical acts. Like, sure, yeah, it's, you know, when you have a, as he said, like a process of, of stripping to nakedness and, and representing yourself as pure without these carry-ons, that's just a material thing. But the, the, it's supposed to be symbolic of your mm. willingness to forgo the necessities that you think are, you know, or the things that you think are necessary, um, and to then um, actualize virtues and to actualize the things that are purifying. Um, yeah. So yeah. There's um, inherent like there's inherently a uh, a dignity to the human nature because of you know possessing you know soul in this sense, and it's it's you kind of stripping back to that, I guess we'd say the, uh, the Imagio Dei, to the image of God, uh, in which you can have, you can kind of restore that nobility again. Um, yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's, uh, and that's why that alchemical process is in some, in some sense necessary. And that's also so, similar to the grounds on which we'd like, we'd argue for like the existence of like something like purgatory. Uh, but that's a different matter. <laughs> but I guess so, that you can bring it back to like, fire as being this purifying thing is because oh, yeah. fire essentially disintegrates forms as they are in their compounds and turns them into this pure flame essentially that's 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 Still how they things. viewed it yeah um, and so it is this yeah it's this purification of you know shedding all of the compounded um uh false forms so to speak i guess you could say not false forms but you know compounded material forms and and turning it into a pure ascending form and that's that's hot it's fiery because it's it's um it's it's alive essentially and it's rising upwards and that's yeah. why they they loved using a fire as a um kind of allegorical um alchemy for for fire so i uh, felt sorry for soul so yeah like it, it is definitely this kind of like um you know um the, the the purifying and um what was what would you what you said something that, that's that it was directly relevant to but <laughs> oh, wait, what was it i don't know maybe <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, um, yeah, I said distilling as well. It's, oh, yeah, distilling, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. So it was, like, yeah, the, the kind of, like, fiery purification. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and it I think that's why he uses that example earlier on specifically is because... Yeah, that makes sense. That's that's the... That's how they understood um, soul, and that's often why they said that humans are made up of the four matters, the four elements, and fire was their soul, essentially. At least yeah. within Pythagorean kind of um, classical yeah. elements, and it's the only one that matters. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Oh, jeez. Well, yeah, I think that was there was one line from uh, from six which was perfect, which was like, "For as the ancient teaching was, moral discipline and courage and every virtue, uh, <clears throat> not even accepting wisdom itself, all is purification." 
Because all, yeah. all of it brings you back to that original image in which you were created, in a sense. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess that, you know, it, again, it's like in the kind of uh, Catholic, uh, I guess, spiritual life, it's mortification would be a more severe manner of, you know, earthly uh, purgatory, if you want to put it that way. Um, but yeah, but also the right a- exercise and habits of virtue. Um, <clears throat> but Which, we, he, that that kind of like thing where he says like yeah the soul thus cleansed is all idea and reason. Yeah, um, it, it ties directly to I forget where he said it. I just pulled out quotes, but like one of them he says okay. like an ugly thing is something that has not been entirely mastered by pattern. That is by reason. The matter not yielding at all points and in all respects to ideal form. So. He's identified the ugly thing being something that has been like this is earlier on that he's, he's he's mentioned this. He's identified the ugly being something that hasn't been mastered by pattern, which is the the influence of reason because a pattern exists because reason has reasoned it out, right? Um, has has brought an influence of reason to what otherwise would be just a mess, and that um, when it hasn't done that. And the ugly thing is um, not yielding to the ideal form. He, by identifying that, this is when he says, so the soul's beauty comes from being cleansed by anything that would disrupt reason and disrupt the idea. And so that's why he says there that the cleansed soul is all idea and reason. Um and then he continues, holy, free of body, intellective, entirely of that divine order from which the wellspring of beauty rises and all the race of beauty. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, nice. I mean, um, there was, where are we? Um, there was, I think there was, there was important distinctions to make because, I mean, this is important, very Platinian distinctions to make, of course, between, okay, so we have, the beautiful soul or the soul that is a kind of yearning for beauty. So we will call it the, uh, what was that uh, Greek word I used before? Uh, erotic koterai. Uh, I'm, I'm butchering that. But Erotikoi. It, erot- yeah, no, it's it's a little bit longer. Uh, Erotikoi Probably, was how I yeah. initially said it, but it's, it, I've got it right in front of me. It's erotic koterai, whatever. We've got that. We've got its object, which is real being, which is beauty. But then there's the cause of real being, which is the one, right? Which is the Godhead. And so it's like, okay, well then, the question we then come to is, can we call God beauty? And the question is answered with a yes, but in a qualified sense. Uh, So basically, what Plotinus will say is that, and beauty, uh, this beauty, which is also the good, right, must be posed as the first. Uh, Directly deriving from this first is the intellectual principle, which is preeminently the manifestation of beauty, which is, you know, it is real being. And through the intellectual principle, uh, soul is beautiful as, you know, being caused by the intellectual principle, it having being and therefore it exists and therefore it has that uh, derivative beauty from real being. the beauty in things of a lower order, actions and pursuits, for instance, comes by operation um, of the sh- of the shaping soul, which is the author of beauty found in the world of sense. For the soul, uh, a divine thing, a fragment, as it were, of the primal beauty, uh, makes a beautiful to the fullness of their capacity all things whatsoever it grasps and molds. And so we can kind of see how you have declensions of beauty from the, I guess you could, in the sense that Eugenia likes to predicate things of the Godhead, he'll say, okay, you have, you know, wisdom, truth, beauty, which we ascribe to things which exist, but we'll call it, we'll call it like super beauty or like uh, be, the beyond beauty, which is also beautiful in this analogical sense, which is the one or the good, the Godhead. And then we have real being, which is uh, the beautiful. And then we have the soul, which yearns for beauty and then can kind of create things which are also beautiful in derivative senses uh, with mediation from real being, which is true beauty, supported by the very fact that, uh, you know, you have the good, which is the object of yearning, you know, the teleological reason why anything beautiful might be made by at the hands of the soul. And then it displays these aspects of beauty that is constituted by real being. Uh, And so there is a kind of 
uh, how do I put it? There's an, an intrinsic interrelation between the various grades of reality in so far as they create, and in so far as they create, uh, they always create something beautiful, uh, but always kind of in this in this inherently like kind of descending flow because that is how the the cosmology here works. It's it is yeah. this kind of waterfall in a sense. I mean, uh, this is um like an overflowing. That's it. Overflowing. Yeah, like to bring it like directly to, I mean, this this just speaks perfectly to Hesiod's um, theogony, um, particularly in that you have Uranus, which is the first, like, you know, it, as far as the hierarchy is concerned, often Uranus, which is how Plotinus uses him as well, is um, like, you know, the first, and it's from Uranus who has the, uh, you know, the, the order of the gods that come after him, the Titans and then the gods. And from directly from Uranus, you have the birth of Aphrodite, and who is beauty, um, naturally. And it is in that birth that you have um, you have Kronos, which is the intellect or the intellectual principle, um, as a kind of like intervening kind of like element of this like mixture that produces the beauty as like this heavenly, you know essence um which is like the eternal beauty i guess you could say that the beauty as a as a eternal being um but then yeah. when he mentions like you know it comes by operation of the shaping soul or well, this is why aphrodite is married to hephaestus or hephaestus <laughs> can't pronounce his word um hephaestus <laughs> because he is the metalworking stonemasonry um god of sculpture um and it's through He's this union that there's this kind of like working together, but there's also a big mention that Hephaestus is known as like the um like the crippled god or the god that has some kind of deformity, and the reason for that is that because we have this um you know the we, while we have the shaping soul, what is shaped then into the cosmos is kind of like this ugliness, so to speak, um and that is the the shapes of like the, that's mixed between you know matter and and beauty and and it's the beauty within that kind of shaped like forms that are that are that are mundane that you find then aphrodite pandemos um which is kind of the beauty of the world i guess so you could it, you could at least see like you know, like where the theology kind of plays out um yeah. and how this is kind of like antiquated um understanding which then also plays into orphism which has a it, it doesn't parallel one-to-one -one, but a very similar theogony as hesiod um you would have to pick that apart another day because i don't have it off the top of my head that's right, hesiod's yeah. more more immediately aware to me but um it's like yeah so you can see that there's this kind of like graded development um and how beauty comes out and and the good thing is that i mean if we end up doing an episode on on beauty uh sorry you on know, love on love later on. I, I reckon we we definitely should uh take a look at uh and what was it any had three i don't remember which one it is yeah um, but but when we do it like we'll see that kind of like used by Plotinus as like his example of um of its operations but yeah, yeah. um that'll, that'll be a good follow-on from this but yeah um it's it's very much like i guess that um uh what's the word um i don't know it, yeah it, like it's just a very yeah the, the, as you said like the grade like the gradations of kind of reality um and how it's actualized and um but they ultimately, interplay with each other yeah right? and, and but ultimately like the the, the theo theological understanding is that you know it's the way that it's kind of received in a sense not in the sense that like it actually is this con kind of disjunct you know there is this like layer of gods which is disjunct yeah. from the next layer of gods <laughs> yeah, which yeah, is yeah. disjunct from that it's more that it's graded by the reception that we have of it so you yeah. know it, in reality it's this kind of like the divine isn't to be dismantled into all different little bits but and then you know and and to treat it as if you could separate them from one another but rather that there's this constant like um reversion and there we go, um nice. 
so yeah so that's how i would see beauty is that the reason why we say that there's beauty that comes from the first and but also is a direct derivative of the first which is almost kind of sounds like a contradiction in saying but it's because it's the reversion of communion essentially um yeah, nice. which brings what is below it into oneness with it yeah yeah oh uh, that's that the yeah, that makes perfect sense um let's well we already did well you kind of did seven and you did you took the best part of seven so <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice <laughs> um but yeah i mean uh, the only things to go over with seven again would be you know you know it, attaining the beautiful has this a profound impact on the soul it leads us to despise you know lower kinds of beauty and love and for those you know uh, you know the, these the, these kinds we despise come from outside a derivative but true beauty is contained uh, self-contained and makes its lovers beautiful and lovable again we have that uh, revertive aspect right because if we uh, if we turn to look back in the ontological sense to what is uh, more fundamental to us, we find that which is more beautiful than us. Uh, and therefore, it's kind of, it is the highest goal, like uh, beauty in this, the, I guess the, as I said before, the super beauty in a sense is this highest goal that brings the greatest happiness. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, Plotinus almost makes it sound like the beatific vision where he says, and one that shall know this vision with what passion of love shall he not be seized? With what pang of desire? With what longing to be molten into one with this? What wandering delight? And then coming back to the idea of being wounded uh, with love for beauty, I found the quote from St. Teresa of Avila, and she says this, So powerful is the effect uh, on the soul that it dissolves with desire and doesn't know what to ask for, for it clearly seems that it is with God. You will ask me, well, if it knows this what does it desire or what pains it what greater good does it want she says she doesn't know but she often like uh, she intentionally feigns ignorance so she can do the whole oh well if the uh spanish inquisition doesn't like what i'm writing i can just play off that i'm retarded but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she's she's very keenly aware of what she's about to say which i'll quote now and she says i do know that it seems that the pain reaches into the soul's very core and then when he who wounds it draws out the arrow it seems indeed in accord with the deep love that the soul feels that, that god is drawing these very uh this very depth and core after him I was thinking just now that it is as though from this fire enkindled in the brazier that is my God, a spark uh, jumped out and so touched the soul that the flaming fire was felt by it. And since it was not enough to set the soul on fire, it is so delightful. The soul is left with that pain produced by it just touching the soul. And so she's basically saying that in coming to further intimacy with beauty in this life you were further wounded with desire for true beauty and so there that is the aspect of pain in the sense that you uh, find yourself in further yearning for it not because you're more distant from it in a sense but because you come to know it and know that you don't you perhaps haven't grasped it as much as you possibly can again it's that idea of like you can keep drinking from that chalice and you can get as drunk as you like, but but that yearning is a is a kind of uh, a, it's it's a, it's a hierarchic one, uh, and therefore so, yeah, it's not you're disordered. Ba basically, you're mega black pilled. This is like the relevance as to why. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it depends on what you're black pilled about. If it's about yeah. women, well, then you haven't gone that far. But if it's about the state of society, well, then that is relevant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's go on to, all right, so, um, where are we? So we, we did seven, uh, you did seven, rather, uh, eight. How do we achieve this beauty, right? Okay, we've been, uh, pierced by the arrow of love for, and uh, we have that kind of a deep, uh, erotic yearning for the beautiful itself. How do we transcend towards it? And so how lies the path? 
Uh, he that has this strength, let him arise and withdraw into himself, foregoing all that is known by the eyes and turning away forever from the material beauty that once made his joy. He's not saying that you should just completely forgo the outside world and stay some like monastic contemplative, just kind of meditating on the beautiful for forever. Rather, it's it's again this detachment that you shouldn't have inordinate desire for that which isn't true beauty. Um, for anyone... Uh, for if anyone follow what is like a beautiful shape playing over the water, is there not a myth telling in the symbol of such a dupe how he sank into the depths of the current and was swept away into nothingness? And this reminded me, I'm not sure if he's really playing in Narcissus, you'll know this better than me, uh, but it did seem that like you have this, the idea of the, the image of the self, which isn't the true self that you fall in love with instead of beauty itself, which would be the real being, which is... Well, it's, it, yeah, it sounds like he's kind of referring to the sirens. Oh, okay. Singing and tempting them into the waters only to be sunk. That makes more sense because he goes on to talk about Odysseus in a bit, which I'll let you kind of take the reins for. Yeah, I mean, like, um, he, he, he mentions um, later on, you know, <laughs> let us flee then to the beloved fatherland. Um, and uh, what, what does he say about Odysseus? Uh, for Odysseus is surely a parable to us when he commands the flight from the sorceries of Circe, um, or I think it's pronounced Kershi or something like that, but, or Calypso. I've got to mm. know my pronunciations because I know all the English ones are actually wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not content to linger for all the pleasure offered to his eyes and all the delight of sense filling his days. The fatherland to us is there, there with a capital T, referring to the divine, um, mm. whence we have come and there is the father. Uh, what then is our course? What the manner of our flight? This is not a journey for the feet. The feet bring us only from land to land, nor need you think of coach or ship to carry you away. All this order of things you must set aside and refuse to see. You must close the eyes and call instead upon another vision, which is to be waked within you, a vision, the birthright of all, which you turn to use. So the significance I see in this is particularly that you can often like see it also in the imagery of um, how gods were depicted in their statues. You had particular gods that were winged, and um, this kind of like imagery is to be seen as referring to the necessity of overcoming this kind of like um, very human foot bound kind of thinking where you would try to ascertain the diviner state just through the the, the mundane kind of um, travel. So it's when they have like depictions that use wings and um, uh, you know mainly mainly it's us using wings. It's the divinities that actually move. How it's understood anyway is is that move between the realms. So you have um, Hermes who is winged. And you have one that I spoke about recently. You have Nike, who is winged. Um, and you have Cupid or Eros, who is winged. These winged gods are kind of representations of how what they are um, expressing and what they are in the divine is something that is a motioning between, you know, the realms, so to speak. But they emphasize that the the route between you know the mundane things that are realized or actualized by their works to say it in a very general sense um are not to be like uh they're supposed to lead you upwards in a way that isn't mundane or or isn't so rooted in the kind of general understanding of human travel so here he has represented you know the, it's not by foot, and it, but it, rather it's a vision that's awakened within you. It's a birthright of all souls, essentially. Um, yeah. And that and leads directly into yeah. chapter nine, where he basically kind of explains this. But mm. Nice. I, I, I'm glad you made the distinction about um, the, the physical travel as really just an analog. And I think we can, we can play this out a little bit further, where it's like Proclus asks basically where is there beauty in things whose substratum is pure and where is the good in things constituted by passivity and imperfection and this is from his co commentary on parmenides basically he says that 
none of these objects of perception is truly what it is called. So that even if you consider these, the, the heavenly bodies, though they might be more exact than material things, you will not find perfect precision in them. Think again of triangularity versus the drawn triangle. It's you won't, you're not going to find perfect precision in this drawn triangle but in triangularity itself which is non-material you you'll find real being uh and so the example which this is why i'm bringing it up the circle by its nature is without beginning or end to take part of it is to abstract out a section uh that is then rendered wholly unintelligible as being part of what it was once integrated to and then uh also irrevocably uh irrevocably destroying its uh it's <clears throat> it's prior hole. You can take a circle, you take out a chunk. What have you got? You've got like a, a C-looking thing and you've got a, a curved line. Put them out into two separate uh, like visual contexts and you can't really see them as being what they were prior unless you have, you know, the memory that allows that continuity. Um, but the, the truly circular and having no such beginning or end is not subject to such divisions as such. So... The contraries and heavenly motions, this is Proclus again, uh, such as their contrawise revolutions, their centers, and whatever other contrarieties there are in the powers of heavenly bodies, these naturally exist together but have been allotted existence in an extended subject. Neither the truly circular nor center is pivot nor poles can exist uh, precisely in extended things. How could these realities whose natures exist in particles and unextended be perfectly present to what is extended and, vis and, and divisible. So basically, he is making the implicit argument that uh, the, we can say, uh, call them platonic forms again, the eidos, the reason they are, the reason why they are kind of, and this comes back to what you were saying about uh, the gods before, it's like, it's, it's not like the, you have like, uh, you know, a, a group of divinities over here, there, or whatever. It's, again, you, in the Christian context, it's like you don't just have God in heaven. So like he's in like some suspended realm and then he kind of like uh, as some like i don't know has instruments by which he then like pokes in through the clouds or something it's yeah, like and the yeah the, the the heavenly host isn't like a separate entity yeah yeah, yeah exactly so it's like the any a thing insofar as it is transcendent which is proclus's point it's also equally as imminent which is why god's transcendence is also his imminence uh, in a sense, it's his omnipresence, right? His otherness to things, his uniqueness is why he is so uh, present uh, to all, right? You you think think about I don't know, God is uh, the one, where it's like, well, anything to be has to be one. Uh, if it displays no unity, it it, it doesn't exist. And so, if God is in this sense the sustaining uh, cause of unity, he is present to everything that is, but he is as the sustaining cause of unity, he is not contained within that set of all things that display unity. And so his radical otherness is completely coextensive with his radical presence, in yep. a sense, right? And so that's why we can't think of divinities of any kind, whether they be angels, gods, uh, the, the first, in these kind of disjunct senses, right? And it's the same thing with number. It's the same thing with uh, triangularity itself. Yep. It's just as transcendent as it is imminent. Um, and it's the case with everything with real essences, right? And so um, <clears throat> basically our soul can kind of receive and grasp in activity things far purer and more precise and sensible appearances, uh, correcting the sensible circle, uh, saying by how much it falls short of the unparticipated, transcendent, but also yet imminent circle. And clearly this is because it, it sees something else, uh, uh, as Proclus would say, a light more radiant than the sensible object, as though yet through the sensible object as an inextricable portal to the higher. That's my use of the word portal. I, I think he said something that's a little bit different. Uh, but for the beautiful work of art, the gorgeous woman, may all enrapture our gaze through this, uh, the Greek word is claritas, or radiance that emanates its splendor outwards. We think again about like, uh, you know, creation is this outpouring from the Godhead or something. It's very, like, very cool that that would be like, no doubt, the root of the word clarity. Yeah, that is. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't think of that one. That's that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, something that's like literally emanating clarity, mm. and this kind of that that's very good. I like that. Yeah, 
<laughs> well, there you go. But I guess if we tie it back to what you were saying about uh, the the physical movement, like to go on a journey, um, it comes back to the idea of the trace, right? Where it's like, even when an actual physically beautiful thing is passed or grasp, it kind of leaves a trace of its presence. So I kind of think, okay, uh, think of, I don't know, you've got this beautiful woman who is at a ball. Like, uh, you, you, you still like, perhaps have like rumors after she's passed and the ball has ha happened maybe a week later and like do you see grace in that ball gown she looked divine on the night such uh traces lower versions of what they might be allow us to encircle back to their sources even in physical instantiations of beauty so the trace both is and is not its wellspring source it has no existence outside from its absolute activity and the dynamic being of you know the grace is the person on the night but it no longer is that night and no longer is grace uh you know present substantially but by following these rumors you can you know lead us we can lead ourselves back to her and bask in her true beauty oh excuse me i mean i was meaning to ask when the next ball that grace might attend it be i might i have to see for myself and there you go if you've got your information from that inquiry now you can come back and see grace for yourself and just like uh the sensible to the intelligible we have a portal back to the true beauty itself so if we use that as the kind of analog, well, okay, now in everyday experience, you know that you have the trace of through sensible beauty to that which is eternally beautiful and always present towards you. And so what do you have to do to circle backwards? Well, um, Ficino kind of tells us that the soul is a trifold circle, right? It gazes back at God as its utmost desire measurable. It contemplates itself prior to uh, all externals, and it descends from the causes of things to its effects and, this, and ascends from their effects to their causes. And that is uh, in, the, in the sense of effect and cause and in desire and in contemplating the self, you have Plotinus's interior turning. You have the uh, ascent from the uh, sensible trace in what is beautiful to the senses out through and towards the transcendent causes God. And, and we're back. I uh, just took a little uh, intermission so Alexander could get a little bite to eat and we're good to go again. Uh, massive scare because it looked like uh, it didn't record and I was freaking out for about 30 seconds and then it looked like it did thankfully record those past two hours uh so we're, we're we're good i think where we left uh where we left off was with uh chapter eight of any ed one one six and so i was using Ficino and uh the trace of you know the, the the actual physical beauty of of this woman grace uh as the kind of you know, she leaves a trace of her beauty, and so you can kind of follow that and find beauty itself, or the the physical beauty. And you can do that with beauty itself, right? In, in sensible beauty, you can, if you have the uh, the cultivated kind of virtue to uh, know how to engage in the investigation of beauty, you can find it and have union with it. And so if we come back to, so I, I mentioned Ficino in the trifold circle that it, you know, the soul is a trifold circle because it gazes back at God, it contemplates itself prior to all externals, and then it descends from the causes of things to their effects, and then back from their effects to their causes. Um, and so when we come to contemplate uh, the first uh, God as a beauty, basically Dionysius the Areopagite tells us that the Revolution brings the soul to the beautiful and to the good, which is beyond all things. One and the same, and neither has a uh, beginning nor end. The beautiful, uh, uh, this is quoting him from uh, Divine Names, uh, I think it's chapter four, uh, but the, the reference number will be 701c. Uh, the beautiful, which is beyond individual being, is called beauty because of that beauty, uh, that beauty bestowed by it on all things in each in accordance with what it is it is given this name because it is the cause of the harmony and splendor in everything because like a light it flashes onto everything the beauty causing impartations of its own wellspring ray beauty bids all things to itself hence it is uh, called beauty and gathers everything into itself and so the good the one god and beauty uh, or uh, are convertible uh, for that which is utterly perfect and radiant 
uh, in the same uh, as which is is the same rather as that which all desire uh, is directed towards, as uh, Plotinus said earlier, actually, and I don't think we touched on this. Uh, the good is that which all desire uh, in the kind of teleologically constituted manner, but also the, be- uh, the beautiful, uh, it is desired as the go- um, it is desired as the goal of desire, uh, is how Plotinus uh, s- speaks of it. But um, as that is also a characteristic of the good, uh, we might fittingly call the good the beautiful, uh, in a kind of unique sense to itself that nothing else has the kind of yearning and uh, all-encompassing desire in the sense that all are kind of orientated towards back at it, uh, in a sense, or, you know, it's that classic definition again, it's that which all desire, uh, th- that it's unique to itself to call the good, the beautiful, in the sense that we call it beautiful. And so we might say that the physical um, embodied beauty of this imaginary woman, Grace, she has a share in this divine beauty that in some sense, if we were to investigate it, perhaps, we might be drawn back to uh, beauty itself. And so this Brit, what brings us to the, uh, to the last um, uh, part of this tractate. And <clears throat> basically uh, we have this, uh, and this seems to be probably one of the many places that Dionysius has picked up this idea of like the, the, the light. Uh, but it's that, um, when you know that you have become this perfect work through uh, purification, through mortification and all the rest, uh, kind of carving yourself as a statue, it almost reminds me of Yukio Mishima going at the flesh with the steel, sculpting it to perfection. Um, but instead it's, you, you, you're, you're taking uh, virtue and the good and you are using it to strip yourself of all that is supervening upon the soul that is alien towards it and that is ugly by that uh with your self-gathered purity of your being as Plotinus says uh, nothing now remaining that can shatter that inner unity nothing from without clinging to the authentic man uh when you find yourself wholly true to your essential nature wholly only that veritable light which is not measured by space not narrowed by any circumscribed form nor anything diffused as a thing uh void of term but ever unmeasurable as something greater than all measure and more than all quantity when you perceive that you will have grown to this and you are now become uh you will now become very that very vision and now call up all your confidence and strike forward yet a step you no longer need uh a guide strain and see um and so it's it's like that um i I kind of hear an echo here where it's like um aquinas says that uh the blessed in heaven don't have justice the uh the other virtues like temperance and prudence uh and courage because they have no need for it in a sense that they have uh attained their true end um it's not that they are, it, it's not there because it's, it's a lack, but in a sense, it's, it's the ladder they've ascended and kicked away because it's no longer applicable. You know, you know, you need no longer a guide, strain and see. Um, and so what's, what's left atop that ladder is, is just uh, a love in the sense that it's not a yearning, which is unfulfilled, but one that is fulfilled and then delighted in, uh, in its completion. Now it's, uh, at least within the Catholic tradition, is there are different interpretations where, like Gregory Nyssa will say, "Well, the Godhead is in, is infinite, and so you can kind of infinitely progress within it." And there's a kind of nuance that he tries to give there, and I'm not entirely familiar with it, but I know that there's a way in which you can say that uh, the, the 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 soul has perpetual motion and then continues into God, um, uh, or at least the blessed soul does, um, which I think is something Ficino echoes uh, in his definitions of how the soul is immortal and that it must be that which has perpetual motion. Um, but that's that's another debate. But uh, yeah, that's well, kind of I'll what I... Say, anyone who's listening to this from my side, um, I do not support that, so... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, 
Uh, definitely uh, the Thomistic tradition would challenge that. And I don't think Augustine either uh, held the idea of the perpetual motion into God. It's like you, you've been for, you've been completely fulfilled if you behold the good. Like, I don't see why there's like further motion. Wouldn't you be at, at peace, at rest? Wouldn't the, everything that you desire be fulfilled? It almost feels like they're treating God in a spatial sense, which is the kind of the problem. That's how I see it anyway. It's like yeah, this that's... perpetual motion to be going ever upwards or inwards that there's if that doesn't make it really much sense to me because the way that we should be seeing it is through assimilation i guess yeah so it's not that there's this ever ongoing motion but rather there's like an ultimate assimilation in which there's no like there's no more uh what's the word no more compounding of ideas that yeah. would disrupt that equivalence i guess of yeah, yourself in exactly. the divine um so yeah so the, the idea that there's going to be an infinity of um disruptions to that equivalence is kind of denying the possibility of communion yeah so what gregory anissa would have said is he would have said okay you are now in communion except the depths of that communion and its perfection are conceivably endless i'm just trying to be as charitable as possible and again i don't want to caricature him because i haven't read it anywhere near enough nissa to really comment because he definitely does use lots of spatial metaphors but whether or not these are strict uh soteriological realities i i can't really uh definitively sure. say right now but yes that is it it, it is a bit questionable if it is and, as that is like if it is said in that way and is meant in that way well then yeah then the the yeah, former well, applies what we just said yeah exactly uh, but yeah, and so the Platinian conclusion would definitely be more in consonance with something that like Aquinas, Augustine, or Eckhart would say, and they'd say. And what yeah. Plotinus literally says is, is is always emphasizing on rest, not yeah. perpetual motion. Um, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, yeah, um, and I'm I'm sure even in like Saint Teresa of Avila's own experiences, she wouldn't have said, okay, well, uh, you know, I've <laughs> the blessed in heaven that like you know. I've, or, or the, through these visions, I have this idea that I'll, I'll be perpetually just uh, progressing or something. I don't think I've ever seen her say anything of the sort. So if we want some kind of experiential confirmation from somebody who's got a sanctified mind for Catholics, I think you should probably take her word for it. Uh, and probably Aquinas and Augustine have got this right here. And in this case, Plotinus has it right, I reckon. So, yeah. Uh, what, what, what did you want to say about... Uh, part nine and after that well I guess we'll go just onto general comments but um well yeah I, like funnily enough there's like he, he even kind of just says exactly what we were saying like in the last paragraph <laughs> yeah he, he says that like um therefore first let each become godlike and each beautiful who cares to see god and beauty so mounting the soul will come first to the intellectual principle and survey all the beautiful ideas and the supreme and will avow that this is beauty that the ideas are beauty for by their efficacy comes all beauty else but the offspring and essence of the intellectual being what is beyond the intellectual principle we affirm to be the nature of good radiating beauty before it so that treating the intellectual cosmos as one the first is the beautiful. If we make distinction there, the realm of ideas constitutes the beauty of the intellectual sphere, and the good, mm. which lies beyond, is the fountain at once and principle of beauty. The primal good and the primal beauty have the one dwelling place, and thus always beauty's seat is there. So it's almost like the more that you kind of distinguish things and try to establish a, um, you know, these kind of like depth is really kind of the source of distancing yourself yeah um and so it's about conceiving at first that the intellectual cosmos is all one and then realizing that the all one of the intellect is itself um derived from the good which is you know that the one like the intellectual as a one is in itself beauty radiated from the good and yeah. then you when you surmount that that's when you come into the superior oneness and then that should be that rest which Plotinus talks about elsewhere so that's where where if you were to take that kind of infinite like quest inwards towards complete uh you know infinite divine 
um, that would suggest that, you know, there would be this continuous process of even greater depths of beauty that is, you know, prior, uh, that, that, that comes after, it's posterior to the one, um, which ultimately we shouldn't see it like that. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to be particularly metaphysically coherent. So it's like, I think the only way to salvage such a theory would be to say, okay, well, that's, it's more, perhaps then we could say that the, the sanctified soul, the soul that actually has proper detachment, or at least has the inklings of it and has that kind of turning back towards the good, perhaps that is the soul that is in some sense, in some sense with the good, or at least as something that is, you know, it's it's not delighting, as Plotinus said prior, uh, in its deformity. So I guess that's the first kind of turning away, right, towards that, uh, but turning away and then back towards the good. And mm. that's like the start of the, the motion. But then it's... I, that motion is definitely not infinite because otherwise you would never reach it because the finite yeah. can't traverse the infinite. I think that's just a regular yeah. like propositional logic even. Um, and so it's like, okay, then that journey is then following the trace that we said kind of before uh, through the grades of reality and then that necessitating you going through that alchemical process again, unveiling yourself, becoming more naked uh, spiritually before... Uh, the bridegroom uh, yeah. for God. And that that seems to be the, the formulation that makes the most sense to me. And especially within Plotinus too, the understanding that the soul is quintessentially of the same essence as the one. Like there's yeah, no, yeah. there's not to make, the, the, the distinction lies in our, you know, in our uh, method of, you know, of, of making distinctions. But, that is entirely something that isn't true, I suppose you could say, when you take it back to the, the primal unity. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's when we have that kind of quintessential equivalency, um, which is necessary for omnipresence anyway, um, mm. you have to have the kind of, like, understanding that you actually can reach that peak. Yeah. but. Obviously, it's not that you become the one. It's more that you actualize your place as already being in the one and being essentially, you know, the one in <laughs> in a sense, if you know what I mean. Like, I, yeah, I know what you mean. It's by participation. This is what Boethius always liked to say in a what was it, the Consolation of Philosophy. And this is like, I guess this this will be me speaking now to any uh, pagans watching this. If there's one piece, I think now of uh, Christian Platonic literature that is probably the most amicable to pagans and is po entirely properly Christian. It's Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. And I, that's me just not saying to, you know, I, I mean, like, you could read Ficino, but I then go off recommending, like, every single one of his commentaries and all of the Platonic theology. I'm not going to do that. So if you want an introductory text, uh, Boethius's Con well, yeah, Consolation Boethius of Philosophy. Boethius was a Roman senator. Um, yeah. And, um, I think it was also console at some point. Yep. And um, and honestly, like, yeah, like from I haven't read him completely. I read a little bit, and I read the the quotes that you sent me, and he does seem pretty, like, like he, he almost like doesn't. I mean, look, <laughs> you probably disagree with me, but like from reading it, it doesn't sound like he's really trying to be like inherently Christian. He's more just being a philosopher, I guess. Well, the way he, he never, he wouldn't ever distinguish the two because the character he's talking to, Lady Philosophy, is he's like, he identifies it as philosophy from the Old Testament. So there's kind of like no way to really separate it. And so every time he does say something that's Hellenic, you'll see that he will only say it insofar as there is an analog in Christian theology. Like this, the bits I sent you, right? I think yeah. the, the best bit would be something like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the truly... Uh, beatified man who is truly happy and this is the the goal of the human life especially in that aristotelian sense is like uh to have uh eudaimonia right and so what what is this what does this happiness constitute what, what is it constituted by and he goes through all the different types of things that people posit wealth fame honor uh pleasure 
uh, power and kind of lady philosophy kind of knocks them off their perch one by one which is also something you see happen in the, in the wisdom literature as well but it's done in a sense that brings concordance between how say aristotle might do this in the nicomachean ethics and how plotinus does it here in in the, in the enneads as well as in scripture and then he brings them kind of in concordance and then concludes that no it's in becoming like divinity that one becomes truly happy that is happy in the sense that they are eudaimo like they have eudaimonia and i think that's something that you see uh the logic here of participation is definitely very platinian uh and where, where we have yeah here where to become pure you have to uh purify yourself to become to have intimacy with the beautiful you have to become beautiful in, in all sorts of aspects um well in the most in in kind of thorough sense of the in the entire person right so while i guess yeah it's it, boethius is the most uh amicable to the to the pagan reader because you can read him if you don't understand the context in which he's like saying certain things you could just read him as just some philosopher uh which is why i recommend him to pagans because you know can get too triggered but like <laughs> <laughs> he, he uh well, he's yeah. very Hellenic, like yeah, like, he sounds very like a Roman classical yeah. kind of thing. He he's he is very um, Hellenic in his kind of understanding, which yeah. like just like quickly doing an epic Google, it seems that academic like academics say that they have trouble con trying to uh, understand how he was both like christian and also hellenic yeah so, they they don't uh, understand the context in which he writes and I, almost every single academic that i've seen academics don't understand anything yeah they're retarded like yeah you throw them plotinus and you can you'll <laughs> we've seen they just, what they just, <laughs> yeah it's just a pandemic of retardation um yeah it's disgusting I almost respect none of them so <laughs> yeah like well we've got like a good like i can name probably five decent academics we, we mentioned gregory shaw just a moment ago um who else is good we got wayne j a uh, j hankey who's pretty good he's done a lot of good stuff in plotinus and like boethius as well area gino uh stephen gersh who did this ridiculous compendium work from uh iamblichus to area gina just doing the entirety of late late platonism and as it developed which is pretty cool but yeah it's there's a handful there's there's a handful when it comes to neoplatonism which sucks um but there are and oh eric pearl is one of my favorites which i'll never stop recommending uh but yeah he um it's uh boethius was re uh, responsible for uh translating uh quite a few i think he translated did, did, what was it the mino or something one of the few dialogues that survived into the middle ages after the collapse mm -hmm. of the roman empire because he was one of the last people who could speak greek uh in in the kind of christian uh in, in christian rome and so he was translating all sorts of things he even translated uh the introduction to arith arithmetic by uh, nicomachus and garasus so that's how neo-pythagoreanism kind of uh continued into the medieval time um era and you get people like uh the sh the chart school uh theory of charts who uh, uh, he translated um porphyry's i saw the i saw yeah. yeah. the yeah. commentary on, um, on aristotle's uh which is, yeah which is interesting categories yeah, that was, he, would explain what influential. I that's what I was like. One of the about. only porphyry works that became influential. Yeah, it's one of the good ones too. I gotta say, like, yeah, out of like, yeah, porphyry is a a hit and a miss, and especially a miss with a Christian reader, <laughs> but uh, also a miss for all sorts of metaphysical reasons because it does seem like I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm just quite um. Yeah, he's he's hit and miss, but I mean, I always kind of like give him the benefit of the doubt just because. A lot of what he wrote hasn't su survived, so yeah, I don't know if what we've received is like the peak of <laughs> his Absolutely. works or not. But um, if you look at the correspondences, and this is something you've pointed out, where it's like, well, with Porphyry, even the people around him didn't seem to take yeah. entirely kindly to him. <laughs> no, well, I mean, at least look, Amblicus, like Amblicus, like Amblicus, kind of just looks at, like didn't view him as being not inauthentic, <laughs> but like he didn't yeah. think that he was like he uh, fully understood or grasped what he was talking about so yeah, yeah like um main, like the biggest thing is mainly that because porphyry was depressed and suicidal he was porphyry says that um plotinus was responsible for um 
preventing his suicide. Mm. Um, but like it for for Amplicus, for Porphyry to try and claim that he's had um, like uh, what's what's the term? What the vision of the good? Yeah, well, that, that he's actually had some kind of like gnosis or some kind of um, uh, I can't believe I can't think of the name. Um, mystical union? What are you thinking of? Yeah, yeah. Well, mystical union. There's a particular word that they always use within the tradition. I can't think of the name of it though. Okay. Um, yeah. Like the suggestion that he would have that um, hypnosis. The suggestion that oh, he would right. have he would have hypnosis seems yeah. egreg- egregious to Amblicus because Amblicus says that you know how could you be suicidal and depressed if you're actually so amicable and so close to the one that you would have he knows this. so he kind of shines doubt on his experience there and and i can't you know i have to kind of agree with him like you know you should be like if you you can't you can't approach the gods and then you know the supreme divine if you're in a state of caring about the material state of the world and being depressed and stuff like that which like yeah. i mean that's something that's a hard struggle for everyone um mm. like i'm not to say that i'm a freaking virtuous as hell and i i, I <laughs> somehow survive all that and you know i'm not the one having you know hendoetic experiences but like it, it seems true to me to say that yeah like you can't just immediately climb to the, the absolute mount without any kind of training like you can't yeah. become like you know you can't climb mount everest if you haven't done any training like you you're gonna die like yeah and, so, yeah and it comes back to what plotinus was saying before like you've got to have shed uh those attachments uh if you want to behold beauty itself and yeah, exactly. in in having to in having shed those those attachments it would have also meant you know correcting the dispositions of the soul and therefore there would be no possibility of someone who is suicidal to i mean in the christian context of having spiritual marriage and then continuing to be suicidal i mean it makes no sense you've beheld your god as close as you possibly can in this life and then you still want to kill yourself uh, it yeah. makes no sense and there's i don't think there's a record of it in catholic history that i can think of and it with porphyry yeah it doesn't line up because nobody else from his milieu uh, seems to have that as you know most likely have actually had henoetic experiences with Plotinus. And like, his, like, what? His personality and constitution was probably the complete opposite of Porphyry from what we can see. Yeah, like, and, and it literally says, like, here in the last chapter that uh, of the tractate we we're reading, yeah. never did I see the sun unless it had first become sun-like, and never can the soul have vision of the first beauty unless itself be beautiful. Exactly. Um, and, yeah, like, I mean, if you compare the, the character of Amblicus, or compare the character of Plotinus, um, the character of even Proclus and Damascus, they're very different compared to Porphyry, who seem to be more tending towards the passions and towards, um, and you can kind of see it, like, expressed in, um, you know, maybe maybe someone will attack me for this, but you can kind of see it expressed in the fact that he wrote, like, I don't know how many books it was, but a, a significant series of books against Christianity, and mm. it's, I mean, not not that I'm saying that it was bad, but I'm saying that it shows that there was a passion there that would usually be absent in a philosopher. Like, Amblichus doesn't write a huge series of criticisms, even though he would have been completely, you know, against Christianity. But he yeah. doesn't write a huge series of criticisms. Um, yeah. Damascus and, didn't give a shit about that. And he had a whole yeah, bunch and, of Christians. And, yeah, he was, he was literally like, persecuted. He was getting persecuted. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he didn't care. And it's because, like, basically to care would be this kind of subjugation. And and I say that totally as someone who does care. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, I, I admit that, you know, in the ideal, I should behave differently. And, you know, but ultimately yeah. life is, you know, variable. And I can talk about that another time. But um, <laughs> how I cope out of that. But um, <laughs> no, but, but basically, oh. like, it's it, it shows that there was a passion there and there was this kind of, like, attachment um that isn't present in the other ones um and so i think this is kind of like part of amplicus's kind of um crit- like yeah you know, skepticism i guess towards porphyry's letters to him um yeah 
and like you read the like the stuff that like you read the letters and Amdika's response, he doesn't seem very nice to Porphyry. Um, yeah, kind of just like he doesn't call him an idiot, but he almost does. Like, <laughs> like he's just kind of like just very um, dismissive yeah. and like. He talks like yeah, the way that he talks about it is like, have you not learned anything? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like you know, um, I mean, that's part of the discourse of the academy. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, that's a big tangent on Porphyry. But it, it kind of relates in that you know you have that distinction between you know the beautiful, and it's not to say that Porphyry was, you know, we, we shouldn't read Porphyry because he wasn't no, he's used perfect himself, virtuous yeah. person. Yeah, that's that's like. I mean, it's different, like, you know, um, while ideally everyone should be perfectly virtuous, not everyone always is. Um, and uh, a big part of that is theurgy, which, you know, unfortunately theurgy isn't uh, quite as widely practiced as it used to be. Um, so, but, like, it doesn't mean that they can't produce good works. It just means that there needs to be that kind of knowledge or, or understanding that there is this um, link to the world that hasn't been shed yet, I guess. Yeah, it's like there are, uh, if we come back to Plotinus, uh, the, the tractic again, it's like they don't have that yearning in the, the kind of uh, right and ordered sense, right? Where it's like what they've, what, what they desire and what they've, like, they've come to cling to uh, draws them away uh from what should be their their proper op like um objective contemplation and so this is why you might cast uh, you know aspersions and doubt on someone like porphyry uh on like I i'd say on augustine in his early life um because he he had all sorts of problems of his own which you know very well aware of but and then compared to someone like yeah like uh say uh you know, as as I mentioned before, like Saint Teresa of Avila or like Aquinas and stuff, where it's like you, these people, like throughout their life, are like far more morally upright. But it doesn't mean we don't read Augustine. It doesn't mean we don't read Porphyry. Like as as we mentioned just a second ago, like his Isagoge is uh, it it was historically incredibly influential, uh, and I I definitely would reckon his commentary on on Aristotle is is worth reading. Um, but yeah, I mean, somebody who's entirely consumed by polemics is definitely someone who's not detached. Um, I'd say. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, well, there was something else that I was I was going to say, which was like, because um, what you said about Porphyry reminded me uh, that. Uh, so um, Meister Record had something interesting to say where he was like, no creature can constitute your blessedness, nor can it be your perfection here on earth. For the perfection of this life, which is the sum of all the virtues, is followed by the perfection of the life to come. Therefore, you, uh, you have to be and dwell in the essence and in the ground, and there God will touch you with his simple essence without the intervention of any image. Uh, and when he says image, oftentimes it's uh, he doesn't just merely mean it in like like a cognitive representation or like uh, a sense perception, uh, but also in a, actually any attachment to that which has being um, that is other than yourself. And so he he'd say like uh, no image represents and signifies itself; it always aims and points to that which is it, it is an image of. And since you have no image, but what is outside yourself, what is uh, drawn in and through the senses and continuously points to that which it is an image of, is therefore impossible for you to be beatified by any image whatsoever. And therefore there must be a silence and stillness, and the father must speak in that he must give birth to his son and uh, perform his works free from all images, which speaks volumes to how we might continue kind of contemplating Plotinus on, um, uh, what was it, uh, withdrawing into oneself uh he the inner vision which he speaks of at the very end of uh that tractate uh what is its operation and in that sense it's like um it i think i i see in there uh proclus's flower of the soul where it's like you have the one in the soul in a sense and that corresponds almost perfectly to as eckhart and uh, uh 
Teresa of Avila and the rest of the Carmelites would say, like, you have God who dwells in the interior mansion, like the recesses of the soul, the ground, uh, as uh, Eckhart would say, in the most fundamental part. Um, and for Proclus, it's like a, it's an epistemological necessity, which is definitely a topic for another time, because I think we should do maybe even a whole episode on, on the good and the one, just just riff off that. I know Plotinus is a good tractate, which is the last one, I think, of the Enneads, if I'm not mistaken. I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's, it's um, I don't know how to put it, it's like, as soon as you start yearning for... Uh, that which points outwards, uh, whether if, if if you yearn to be in discourse, and this is really relevant for anyone on Twitter, right? If you yearn to be in that, uh, in to be to be within polemics uh, and to be you know constantly arguing uh, over like the politics of the day, uh, you won't find happiness, and that should be evident. That should be evident from the very activity. You should completely disengage from that if you would actually want to find beatitude, if you want to find beauty itself, where is the beauty in arguing for three hours straight on twitter.com uh, over like whether or not we should like, I don't know, use the sonorad or something. And like these stupid, like these stupid fucking debates, man. Like, <laughs> Oh, like, like, uh, like Catholic Twitter and race mixing might be the stupidest debates I've seen in my entire life. Um, like, these things are not going to get you closer to God. Shut up. You're not going to convince anyone differently. The only thing you can do on this website is ratio people and talk to people who agree with you and you can agree and amplify. But at which point, that's not discourse. So, I guess the practical element of what Plotinus has said here in this uh, tractate on beauty is uh, you kind of need to be aware with how you kind of interface with the rest of the world and how much of that is uh really allowing you to cultivate your own virtues if things are just perpetually making you angry and passionate about like uh uh i guess ephemeral things you should probably reconsider what you're doing how you're spending your life yeah. um of all, <laughs> like, of all this i have to say i am completely guilty yes <laughs> same like, I like myself I'm, off Twitter, the hard thing, not right? helping it's one thing to just do it and not know that it's, you know, you're you're not <laughs> applying yourself in the most divine way possible. But then it's like the next level where you do know that it's not <laughs> conducive, <laughs> increasing your own divinity, and then you do it anyway. Yeah, but, exactly. <laughs> it, um, dude, it, like, it condemns us so bad. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, this is like, as I said, I mean, I wasn't going to talk about it. I, I mean, it's a whole other can of worms, but... Um, I mean, at least I guess it kind of depends on your point of view. Um, yeah, but because naturally, I believe in reincarnation and um, the which I was supposed to respond to your thing. Which oh yeah, <laughs> I have a like written like, like uh, half a response, and then I just forgot about it because you like disappeared from Twitter for a while. But um, I'll I'll get back to it eventually. All all yeah. of my eventual works but um basically like the way that i like kind of see it is that i mean there is this um this is the kind of cope where like you can see that it, the, there is a requirement of you that's higher but then there's also like there's no escaping the circumstance that you kind of exist within like the context mm. and um or not there's no escaping but there is a difficulty that comes with the context and inherent limitations right yeah and like when you have this like state of the world that is so far gone and so alienated from what is good you naturally have this kind of burning uh necessity of or a, a feeling of necessity not that it is a necessity but a feeling of necessity towards rectification of that kind of existence and it's mm. the uh like as Plotinus says let the soul fall in with the ugly and at once it shrinks within itself denies the thing turns away from it not accord and resenting it it's this like overwhelming kind of feeling of ugliness or surrounding that you end up kind of feeling isolated and so out of this feeling of isolation 
is a desire to rectify and to try and elevate the things that are isolating you into a state that's more um beautiful i guess yeah so it's by the overwhelming sense of that which i think is deliberately kind of encouraged because there are forces in the world that want you to be distracted by these things yeah, um sure. it's it's this kind of feeling that obliges you that kind of denies that perfect state of despite the ugliness of the world you can still overcome it um so i guess what i mean is not to feel like awful in the context of like i can't believe i feel so obliged to these things mm. because i mean it's it's part of the path i suppose because you need to be able to see the ugly in order to know the the beautiful um and yeah. it's a difference from the soul that relishes in the ugly for the sake of its own ugliness mm -hmm. um but then there's also a grade that comes above that which is extremely difficult for someone who is um steeped in it but then yeah of course like this comes down to like do you limit yourself from seeing the ugliness and i guess it kind of depends on your point of view on the question and your overall worldview um and i mean maybe it's good for someone to disengage completely while for someone else they may feel that they need to be involved to help rectify it which is where i kind of see the um at least the the point of reincarnation kind of coming in where there is there are lives to be lived that are on the path but not completion like it's not a completion oh i see what you're getting at yeah yeah so it's like okay well if i if i do well now and i it, I, I sacrifice perhaps this life um so that the present world could be changed the one that i reincarnate back into would be one that's more conducive for, for you know reversion. intimacy with yeah yeah right okay that's interesting because i think <clears throat> what someone like eckhart would say which would be um Kind of like how you can do the whole, like, have your cake and eat it too, the both and, right? Which is, I guess, the, the antinomy here, where it's like, okay, can you do both? Because, like, the question is, if you do engage now, will you actually reincarnate to enjoy that life? Or you, will you come back as, like, something more depraved because you had to engage in some kind of, maybe not extreme depravity, but in some sort of depravity, which was to ameliorate uh, further depravity in the future for, for 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 a future reincarnation, and so Meister Eckhart would say, and this was his uh, big critique of contemplative mysticism of his time, uh, was that there was a in in Catholic uh, kind of monasticism, and I guess especially amongst the Dominicans specifically, which isn't so much monasticism, but whatever. Um, it's you have this strict distinction between the active and contemplative life, right, and. Oftentimes, this came out of a very reductive reading of Martha and Mary, which was, okay, Martha has the best part contemplating by Jesus's uh, side, but then you have, uh, sorry, Mary does, but then Martha has, um, sh she's the one out and working, and she asks Mary to arise from, uh, from Jesus and to come help her. And so uh, Jesus says, uh, no, no, uh, Mary has the best part, leave her be. Um, and so the Dominicans had typically, uh, and I, I'm not sure about the Franciscans, I'm not sure if they'd done the same, the Dominicans of Eckhart's time and said, okay, well, that means that the contemplative part is the best part, and that's what we should focus on. Um, and so the active, while it's necessary, because Mary has a real part and we should honor that, uh, sorry, Martha does, Mary is what we should cleave to. And so maybe we can sacrifice the active, what we can sacrifice actually rectifying the world to a degree for the contemplative um and then eckhart would turn around and say no basically not only have you interpreted uh this wrong and uh, kind of out of lockstep with the rest of what scripture says because you eventually you get the likes of saint like saint paul saying like well like you know i've i've had my vision in the third heaven but i i'd come out of it to feed a, a poor man's soup um you, you'll have they he reinterprets it as okay no you've um it's actually the case that Martha has further spiritually matured. And so she can go out and be active, but she's already had the best part. She's had that uh, kind of uh, spiritual rectification, which 
Mary being a little bit less spiritually mature is experiencing now. So her due part right now is to be the contemplative and afterwards she will come and rise and work with Martha. And this is something that the Carmelites are, I, I think, largely independent of Eckhart have concluded on as well. But I guess the point for reincarnation then would be the the ultimate goal would then be to kind of have the uh, somehow manage to marry the detachment from uh, from the things of the world with an active imminence in the world, which allows you to rectify it in the sense that you are the, the soul is never stirred to start yearning and becoming attached to the things that it's rectifying in political situations or whatever right now um and you know uh trying to set up institutions what have you well whatever it might be right but instead to hold fast to to the good um while also uh you know engaging in uh, practical projects and not getting inordinately attached to these project projects as such and so that way you can both and it you can have your cake and eat it too you can have your honosis uh, without falling into literal uh like uh emotional depravity of this of this like of the type of porphyry and you can set up your academy and you can do all the rest and you can care about it and that way you can also benefit from that spiritually if you want to think about it from somebody who does believe in reincarnation you could then be like okay well that will allow me uh perhaps re-entry into a better life not only because I've lived virtuously, but because I've created a better environment to come back to. And so that would be the both and to basically apply yeah. Eckhart's logic. That is the big ask though. That'll be like, that is like the most demanding sort of, uh, of path to take. And I think that's also why uh, St. Teresa and the Carmelite reform was uh, so uh, viciously, uh, opposed by uh the 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 Carmelites that preceded her because it demanded so much more of them to uh and so yeah i mean like it's not something that is it's not it's not easy to catch on like that uh and it's definitely yeah. not easy for the individual com contemplative to literally straddle both the active and contemplative worlds well this is the thing like um but Plotinus did it <laughs> yeah i mean this is I mean, this is the thing, right? Like, in theory, like, they always, like, they being critics. Yeah. They always kind of, like, go, oh, you know, like, Platonism and its virtues and stuff like that, they're so, like, denying of life. Like, they're, like, you know, they 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 want you to be, um, what's the word? They want you to be, uh... Like, nature in the clouds. You just want to be in yeah, the clouds. Yeah, like, they, the they want you to, um... <laughs> I, forget the, I forget the word. I don't know why I forget the word. What is it? They want you to be um, like strict bear. Don't don't enjoy anything in life. Um, to be world like denying, a, right? yeah, to be world denying and blah 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 and whatever. But like the, the the thing is, is that the reason why that kind of lifestyle was encouraged is not because it was illegal, like it was evil to <laughs> enjoy some of the goods of the world. It's more that it's if you if you can't enjoy the goods of the world and not fall into loving them so much that you neglect your other obligations then you should be completely stripped of having the goods of the world just for, like for your own sake essentially like it's yeah for the sake of your soul that makes sense um but like in theory like if you were to be so like you know so much the sage that it doesn't impact you like you could one day be wildly rich and you know have massive feasts and whatever and then the next day lose it all and it makes no impact on you whatsoever well then that that is basically the sage state that can enjoy those things because it isn't attached they, they aren't attached to them um mm, mm, so yeah. it, it's not that it's world denying it's more that you can only enjoy the world once you've conquered it essentially yeah nice um, that's, that's, so, that's great i love that yeah and and i think that's the kind of like thing that's missing in in how it's understood like um with with a lot of people is that it's not just denial of the world for the sake of it but it's it's about conquering the world and once you can do that then you can enjoy it 
Um, yeah. Both both Dante and Eckhart literally say the same thing, where they go, uh, Dante's one is really funny, because he, he um, in De, De Monarchia, he's arguing basically, okay, so this is why the Ghibelline rule is correct, and why we should have a Holy Roman Emperor that has jurisdiction over the entire known world, and his power should be absolute. Here's the moral reason why, and his, his argument goes like this. If the sovereign ruler of the visible world owns everything, then he doesn't have the, the desire for anything more. And if he has no more desire for anything more, because he already attains everything material, therefore he can't. His desire can't be inordinate because he has his desire has been fulfilled and completed. And so basically, he says the 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 absolute ruler of the entire known world would necessarily be one of the most just and perfect rulers possible. And while he might be jumping a few uh, logical steps along this equation <laughs> uh, <laughs> for a polemic, um, what he does say echoes, I think, better in Eckhart's logic, where he basically says the ideals, uh, I get you will use your, your language, sage, right, has basically, um, he has this, he has such a spiritual poverty in a sense that he is, no, he isn't like, intimately tied to and feeling pangs of loss when he loses what he has that he could he could literally own the entire world own kingdoms and all the rest uh but because he is detached from them he owns them in a sense that there isn't the reciprocal ownage uh, in the <laughs> ownage in the sense, <laughs> yeah. literally actually in the sense that his possessions don't possess him he possesses yeah. them perfectly and that is pure spiritual poverty you uh you you deny the power of those things that you own because yeah. that is the proper relationship right you own them and therefore they don't stir your heart to do this or that yeah exactly which, which is kind of like the way that i see it is when you put it within like the platonic hierarchy where you have mm. like the particulars which are unified within a higher principle that is in itself one um yeah that's essentially the activity that you're engaging in if you you know if you want to enjoy one of the pleasures of the world but it's not in a way that you are obliging yourself to it or that you need it or something like that but rather it's just part of what makes the holistic part of you um possessing those things in a way that doesn't have a counter possession um then that's just part of the nature of your existence essentially like you know um like human enjoyments the the things that we enjoy doing and and enjoy experiencing like all of that falls into a higher unity which is the uh, moderation and virtue um which controls and um directs the behavior of the saint uh, of the saint Gosh, I'm, I'm no, no, no. I'm rubbing off on you. No, I'm going to get um, a whole bunch of comments like, oh, look, he's proven he's a, he's a hack. He's of the sage. <laughs> look, that's to funny. be honest, look, saint comes from Latin, so yeah. Yeah, so, so that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, so um, that unity that control like that that the uh, the sage is participating in means that he can he can enjoy the wholeness of that unity without it corrupting him um without it drawing him towards the particulars but um i think we're we're going it's going to be a very long podcast yeah um, sure i was i was saying this, i was thinking the same thing how do we so wrap, up wrap it up because <laughs> we, we can ramble on these topics forever yeah. and i'm happy to do that <laughs> but um how, how should we how should we end this um well, the next time I think oh, we'll we'll do this again because I, I there was I think the plan was that we do on beauty and then we do on love yeah and we have a whole proper episode on eros which we call and we can do uh, the uh, we can do the whole thing about the two like Venuses as you were speaking about before and I think Ficino has a whole bunch of commentaries on that which I'm keen to get to mm -hmm. um, and Ficino's best. I think commentary he's got and the most one he's most renowned for is is De Amor, which was on the symposium. So I think that I, I think an episode cool. which allows us to do the symposium too would be interesting. Um and then I guess that's the first one, the on love. And then uh after that we might I think I wanted to do on number. I think that'll be a fun kind of 
metaphysically autistic. Yeah, that'll be a good so, schizo, <laughs> schizo one, yep. Perfectly Pythagorean. And then somewhere along the lines, uh, I, I said we should do one on, on, on the good. I think we'll that'll be the kind of general sketch and that'll be kind of what we'll do for the next time, whatever the next time is, and probably be another like three months. <laughs> but yeah. It's been good, man. Thanks for coming on. If you want to just, you can plug your, your stuff one more time. I'll definitely throw it in the, in the, in the description. So yeah, just... no, just check out the description. Um, and yeah, like check me out, I suppose. Um, but <laughs> if you're going to follow me and just comment evil things, then, um, don't check me out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why would you because have I've got a couple people who do that. Desires. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's gross. Yeah. No, I've got that too. You, I've got like a bunch of like people who like pop up like 30 followers or maybe like sometimes even like 300. I'm like, got nothing but like just shit to like put in my mentions. Even like I got one person who like tried to get me to watch like this like, uh, it was like some non erotica or something. This will get you out of your Catholicism. Like, oh, fuck off. I was like, just no, thank you. So, yeah, uh, none of that, please. Thanks. Bye. And uh, we'll, I'll see you <laughs> for the next one. <laughs> Ciao.